if you're aware of any apologies. Okay, no apologies. Uh, I know that Deputy Chairperson Pat Chain um, has advised that he is on his way, so grateful for that. Uh, agenda item two is Chairperson's business. Um, we uh, will be, well, let me raise it now. And actually, obviously, we've had seen a, a public statement from the Northern Ireland Audit Office with regards to closing the gap on uh, social deprivation and the educational attainment. Uh, my understanding that the media release has uh, reported that over £900 billion pounds of funding uh, has not made any demonstrable difference in narrowing the educational attainment gap, gap between disadvantaged pupils and their more affluent counterparts. Uh, this is among the conclusions of a report published today by Northern Ireland's Comptroller and Auditor General, Kieran Donnelly, CB. Now, members will be aware that, that as a, an audit office report that the Public Accounts Committee at the Assembly is the committee to which that report will be sent and uh, the committee um, that will consider that report. Um, therefore, regrettably, we can't go into it in, in detail at this stage. However, uh, Robin Newton, you wanted to come in on that matter? Uh, I, I do, Chair, and obviously this uh, addressing the educational under attainment gap is a matter that the all members, I think, of the committee have, have been concerned about, uh, certainly since uh, we were reformed back in January of last year. It's a significant amount of money. It is spread over a 15-year period, Chair. I understand the protocol of where we have to go on this, and it is a PAC uh, matter. But I think, Chair, uh, since it is uh, of such concern to the committee at the earliest time that it is possible, um, perhaps the committee would, could receive a briefing on on that uh, uh, billion pounds expenditure and why it's determined that it's been ineffective. Great, Robin. Um, and Clark, if you can uh, get us some information with regards to how and when the Education Committee can, can consider uh, yeah. more closely the issues that are raised in that report. It is obviously a profound concern. Yes, I will confirm with you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, then, uh, members. Agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the committee meetings on the 20th of April at page six of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Okay, do you agree, those members? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, agenda item four is matters arising. I have no matters arising, members. Any other members? No? Okay, then. Agenda item five, members, is a, a, a motion that I have uh, proposed uh, to serve as an education committee motion in relation to restrictive intervention and seclusion of children and young people. Can I refer members to the draft motion at page 14 of your packs and invite your views on the wording of the motion and uh, any suggested amendments and then hopefully seek your agreement on uh, the motion being put to the business committee. Can I, can I ask, yeah, so you want to come in there, go ahead. Um, yes, thanks, Chair. I was just going to say I agree with the motion and the wording of the motion and um, will be fu fully supported and I'm really pleased that the committee are able to bring this together and hoping that we'll get full support across the parties because um, we all can agree that the evidence we heard um, a number of weeks back from parents of, of those children that experienced um, restraint and seclusion, that the evidence was harrowing and change need to be, needs to be made. So I'm really pleased that we're bringing this forward and hopefully get some change uh, made quickly, you know. Thanks, Nicola. Clark and members, can I just propose one very minor amendment? Um, the motion at the start reads that this assembly expresses concern at the lack of statutory guidance from the Department of Education on the use of restrictive intervention on children and young people 
with additional support needs. Um, can I just in, insert the word particularly with additional support needs? I just received some feedback to remind me that, of course, it is it, 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 there are other children um, affected by this as well. And whilst the focus of the motion is 100% uh, on the, the impact of improper practice on children and young people with additional support needs, I think it, it might be prudent for us to just amend that to on children and young people, particularly with additional support needs, um, if members are, are content with that one word addition. Members okay to agree the motion as proposed? Yeah, great. Agreed. Agreed. Thank, thank you, members. And Clark, if you can uh, take that to the business committee and hopefully we'll be able to debate that at the assembly as soon as possible then. Okay. Okay, members then, agenda item six is our briefing on flexible school starting age from the Northern Ireland Assembly Research and Information Service. This is a, a, another issue uh, that the committee has prioritised in, in recent times, and obviously we're extremely keen to see legislation progress before the end of this mandate in relation to flexible school starting age. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witness and refer members to the briefing paper from RAISE on school starting age policy and practice? at page 16 of your packs. Can I uh, give a warm welcome then to Sinead McMurray, Research Officer at the Northern Ireland Assembly Research Office, and invite Sinead to brief us on the research paper. Thank you, Sinead. Hi, good morning. Can morning. everybody hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear, thanks. Okay, so I suppose the purpose of the presentation today is to talk about um, flexibility with regard um, to school starting age um, in response to the Minister's proposal um, to introduce some flexibility for parents in um, Northern Ireland with regard to their child's starting age. Um, <clears throat> so I thought for the presentation I'd present some of the evidence concerning um, early and later school starting age and the associated impacts for children. Um, some of the strands of evidence regarding, um, I suppose, the appropriate education for younger children from three years of age onwards. Um, any current arrangements for um, deferring children's school places in Northern Ireland currently, and I suppose the various policies in the rest of the UK with regard to um, introducing some flexibility. So currently school starting age in Northern Ireland is governed by the 1986 Education um, and Libraries Order, which stipulates that children who've reached four on or before the 1st of July will start primary school at the beginning of September that year. Um, <clears throat> similarly, in England, Scotland and Wales, most children start school um, at the age of four, even though the compulsory school starting age is five, which we'll look at um, at a later stage. And I suppose this is in contrast um, to the vast majority um, of European countries and internationally where six is the most common school starting age for children. Um, countries including Austria, Belgium, Poland, Portugal and Australia are starting school age of six. And in some countries, such as Sweden and Finland, um, children actually start school at seven. Um, so France and Hungary are the two countries with lower school starting ages. They're, they have compulsory school starting age at three, but it's more of, I suppose, preschool and um, Montessori style teaching at that stage, but it is mandatory that children attend. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a sore throat. Um, it's important to note that many children start school um, in those countries before the cut-off point. So even though um, the majority of those countries say the school age is six, most children will start before that age. Um, and also the majority of those um, countries do have a preschool, formal preschool education programme. But the majority of children will attend. Um, so I suppose just to give some context around why parents, campaign groups and policymakers um, are advocating for flexibility around the school starting age. Um, there is a solid body of evidence that, to suggest that an extended period of play-based learning for children before they start formal schooling um, is beneficial for their social, emotional and academic development um, and that children aged five and under may not be developmentally ready to undertake um, subject-based academic teaching. Um, and the better um, academic, social and motivational outcomes that are apparent from this sort of extended period of play-based learning is thought to be particularly advantage, are thought to be particularly beneficial for disadvantaged children. Um, 
So in Northern Ireland, the foundation stage of the revised curriculum, um, which became statutory in Northern Ireland in 2007, aimed to give teachers more flexibility in how they teach children in the first two years of primary school. Um, and it places greater emphasis on this sort of play, play-based learning and using it as a context for learning. Um, however, the curriculum does include literacy and numeracy subjects. And pupils are expected um, to grasp key concepts before they move on to um, P2. Um, so I suppose if we're looking at um, the optimum age to start school, the research that is available doesn't indicate that there is a particular age um, that is better or worse to start school. But there is a body of evidence to indicate that a later school start um, may be beneficial. So those, I suppose, who would advocate for that sort of earlier school starting age and the current age of four um, suggest that it gives children who are disadvantaged, um, I suppose, an opportunity to catch up um, on their more advantaged peers. Um, research would indicate that um, disadvantaged children um, are 3.5 months behind their more advantaged peers when they're beginning the school system. Um, and I suppose the suggestion is as well that it's popular with parents because um, I suppose it allows more flexibility with regard to their working hours and for them to go back to work. Um, and also, I suppose, around their cost of childcare. Um, however, a review was undertaken by um, the National Foundation for Educational Research, um, and they found that there was little evidence to support um, those theories as to why um, starting school age four appropriate. Um, however, the review did identify, I suppose, a number of benefits to that later school starting age. And some of those benefits identified were, I suppose, higher scoring on standardised exams, um, and that's both the primary and secondary level, and that was found to be um, across countries. Um, better mental health outcomes in older teens who started school later, um, more active um, participation in the school, um, and greater ability to advocate for their own sort of emotional and academic needs where children had started later in comparison to their early starting peers, um, and also a more positive attitude towards literacy um, and a greater ability with regard to literacy for children who had started later in comparison to their earlier starting peers. Um, and I suppose the evidence of a potentially adverse impact of early school starts um, are borne out when we look at children who are the youngest in their school year group um, or those sort of summer born children as they're referred to. Um, so the Institute of Fiscal Studies along with a number of, of other bodies carried out research on the birth date effect and that highlighted um, large differences in academic attainment between children born at the start and end of the academic year. Um, and while the research did show that, that um, the, the gap, the academic attainment gap, did lessen over time, um, the gap could still be noted up as far as higher education. Uh, research also indicated that children, I suppose, may not be emotionally and socially ready to deal with the number of the features um, of schooling, including extended separation from their parents, um, the sort of capacity to sit still for longer periods of time than would be, be required in preschool, and um, the level of independence required for things like eating lunch, going to the bathroom by themselves, and um, those kind of routine issues. Um, and that because I suppose they are not um, emotionally and socially ready and they're not able to achieve in the same way as their um, older peers, this could lead to lower self-esteem in those children who are younger for their year. Um, so a number of studies have also indicated that a disproportionately high number of children who are younger for their year in school are identified as having um, special, are identified as having special educational needs. So there was a study done in Northern Ireland that showed that children who were young for their year and um, were significantly over, over represented in referrals to educational psychology service. Um, and that pupils with May and June birthdays were more likely to be um, identified by teachers as having behavioural difficulties and behavioural issues. Um, and also it's been identified by the research that children who were born prematurely um, uh, or children um, from multiple births um, may also be adversely affected by an earlier school starting age. So there's research to suggest that children who were born just three weeks premature and consequently fall into an earlier um, school year experience can experience significant setbacks um, in their education. Um, and there's data from the Millennium Cohort Study which showed that twins and triplets um, were more likely than average to be classified as delayed in terms of school readiness. 
And so a later school starting age could be beneficial for children from multiple births. And so as a result, I suppose par parenting campaign groups and government policy across the UK um, is increasingly moving towards flexibility with regard to school starting age as a way to mitigate um, these effects for children who were born earlier or later. Um, in Northern Ireland, currently parents do not have the option to delay their child's entry um, into P1. So in 2016, the Education Authority released some guidelines um, which stipulate that parents um, have a legal obligation to ensure their child receives um, an appropriate education and they're not entitled to any funded um, preschool places at that point. So the parents, if they want them to go to a preschool education in lieu of going to P1, have to, um, I suppose, absorb that cost themselves. Um, and then when they do subsequently apply to um, have their child entered into P1, they don't go through the usual process. Um, they apply to the school and that they want to be admitted to and the principal I suppose is only obliged to give them a place if there is space in the register to um, have them in that year um, and the child will be put with their chronological age group um, rather than into P1 and then once the child is in the school um, the board of governors along with the EA will make a decision as to whether that child should be moved back to P1 or stay with their current group in T2. So in 2014 the Department of Education proposed um, new legislation um, to allow families to seek flexibility for their child when they start school. And along with that flexibility, where it was granted, um, the child would be guaranteed an additional year of um, preschool, a funded preschool education, um, and they would also be guaranteed a, a P1 start. Um, so when the consultation was issued regarding that, public consultation, um, the main proposal was a system of deferral in exceptional circumstances where it is considered in the best interest of the child and um, the evidence provided by the parents would be subject to approval by a panel of experts from the education authority. Um, so there was general agreement um, that parents should have the option to delay, the best, should, to delay their child's starting age and um, that the best interest of the child should be paramount in decisions that are made. Um, and that they, the majority of respondents were in favour of um, new, a newer existing P1 or a newer existing preschool education place to be made available for the child. There was some disagreement within the, the results of the consultation around whether parents should be, um, I suppose, whether parents should have to provide evidence or whether the parents' um, views on whether their child is school ready or not should be given um, full weight. Um, so the minister announced in early 2021 that he intends to bring forward legislation to provide more flexibility for parents and suppose they're currently considering um, legislation on that um, and they're looking at I suppose the potential impact that any policy might have on the provision of preschool places and the impact it may have on school leaving age whether it would have any impact on the curriculum at the various key stages um, and also what kind of implications it would have for area planning. They're currently um, uh, investigating that so um, in the last round of consultations, um, the National Education Union of Northern Ireland um, submitted evidence um, along with the um, School Start Flexibility Group NI, it's an umbrella group made up of um, various NGOs, parents, um, academics, etc. Um, and they included a proposal in um, their evidence to the committee that automatic deferral should be available in limited circumstances to children who fall within certain categories, so very young children whose birthdays are more well, than um, Sorry, very young children who fall within certain categories, so um, the May, June or the 1st July birthday, um, children born prematurely, um, relatively young children who are part of multiple births, um, and adopted and looked after children where it was deemed necessary that they have that um, extra years deferral. Um, and then that also there would be discretionary discretionary deferral available for children who don't fall within those categories um, but where it's identified that um, an extra year would be ideal for um, their development. Um, so that was the proposal that the NEU had put forward um, and they are still supporting that proposal um, and they have I suppose um, as part of their um, proposal they put in um, I suppose estimated rates of when they um, of how much um, of an increase in terms of preschool places there would be and they estimated that initially they think around 4% of children would be uh, granted deferral and that was likely to rise to 
between 10 and 13 percent eventually. Um, and the current rates, the um, proposal that they put in in terms of defer, or in terms of flexibility for school starting age is similar to that in Scotland. And in Scotland, the rates of deferral for children is around 15 percent every year. Um, so I can um, take you through some of that proposal in further detail, or maybe it might be worthwhile um, asking some if you have any questions around it. Um, I was. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, maybe a brief bit of the detail on the proposal, Sinead, just very briefly. Thanks. Yeah. So they um, they stated that now this this previous proposal was in 2016, so I suppose that has to be um, borne in mind. But they estimated that the net financial impact could be a potential annual net saving of um, 0.2 million in the short term to an eventual potential annual net cost of up to 3.1 million. Um, and they were basing that on I suppose four percent of children would be initially um, granted deferral, and that's likely to rise to between ten and thirteen percent eventually. And um, they also based it on the fact that the estimated about twenty five percent of parents um, who are uh, whose children would be eligible for automatic deferral would also opt to defer their child's preschool place. So those children, a uh, percentage of those children who would be deferred, um, would also be deferring their preschool year. So therefore, they would still only be availing of one preschool year rather than. An additional cost of two, uh, another year. Um, they also estimated that based on the savings through a reduction in the number of children being referred to um, the educational psychology service. Um, so they did. So the, the paper is available, um, but that's what they based, I suppose, some of their findings on what the potential costs would be. Okay. Thank, thanks for that. Uh, she is really, really helpful um, as always. Um, so, proposals were consulted on in 2014 then, yeah? Yes, yeah. Okay, um, so it seems um, self-evident self that, that the collapse of the executive was one of the main reasons to prevent yeah, the sorry, there of wasn't, that then, yeah? Um, there wasn't the time to push the legislation through. It had My understanding was that it had got to quite an advanced stage. Obviously, they had consulted on it um, at that point, pub a public consultation. Um, but uh, there wasn't the time to push the legislation through, and therefore it was shelved, which I think is... Okay. Um, another consequence of that collapse. I, I guess the key question for the, the Minister and the Department would be, why, why do we need another public consultation? Yeah, um, I suppose it would depend on um, what they're proposing for... Um, if the, I suppose the proposal that they put forward through or the last time, sorry, was a system of deferral in exceptional circumstances. So I suppose it would depend on what um, what they're presenting, whether the proposal is going to change this time around. And I suppose if there are changes to it, then they would need to consult on it again. Um, but I suppose as yet they haven't indicated what, um, what they're actually proposing in terms of um, flexibility that will be allowed. Okay. Okay, uh, members uh, want to ask questions at this stage. Um, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring members into the spotlight? And keep Shadi there as well in order to answer any questions that we have. Members want to use the hand raise facility in terms of asking questions. Uh, maybe I can start with Robert Newton, MLA. Uh, Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, can I thank Rias, can I thank Sinead uh, for, for this uh, piece of work? Uh, I do know from uh, family experience, um, you know, how difficult it can be for, for, for a child. I, I, I'm very much, uh, Chair, taken by uh, the, the approach, and I'd be very supportive of uh, a degree of flexibility being built into um, the starting age. Uh, can I just maybe just ask, um, Sinead, professional support to get a delay in the child, uh, and I think the word you used was exceptional circumstances. Um, can you do you have a knowledge of what that process is and what the whatever panel it is, would accept as exceptional circumstances? Um, well, I suppose that hadn't been, um, that hadn't been, there hadn't been much detail provided on that, but I suppose in um, the, what the National Education Union were proposing 
was that it would be children who were very young for their years. So those children who were born in May, June or July. Um, I suppose children who were born um, prematurely, who, uh, if they're as a result of being born prematurely, that they're in an earlier um, age group, that they would obviously be academically impacted as well. Um, relatively young children who were part of multiple births, I suppose children with special educational needs. Um, and then children from, I suppose, um, adopted and look after, looked after children who, um, not all adopted and looked after children will obviously um, will need an extra year of deferral, but that the option should be there for them if it's in their best interests. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, the decision in the original round of proposals, the decision would be made by um, the education authority based on the education, or based on the evidence that was presented by the parents and the evidence that was available at the time. Uh, uh, can, can I ask you from you, you, what research you've done, is it a torturous process for the parent or parents to go through rather than the, you know, you, well, you've used your professional support to delay? Um, I suppose um, it, 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 looking at the experience of other um, other areas, so in England um, and say Wales where children want to defer, or where parents want to defer their child's um, school starting place at the moment there is the option for them to apply to do it but it isn't necessarily it isn't automatically granted um, and it has to be considered by the local authorities as to whether they're allowed to um, defer the child starting place and my understanding of it is that it is quite a difficult process for parents um, and that there's a lot of variation in terms of um, I suppose some areas children are just automatically granted the deferral whereas in other areas parents have to jump through quite a few um, hoops to actually get their child deferred um, and as a result, they are considering new legislation now as opposed to um, level out the playing field for all parents in all areas. But my understanding from England and Wales is that is a major problem with the system is that it is quite difficult. Um, and there's quite a lot of paperwork involved and um, actually be able to get your child deferred. Yeah, it's not, not, not really where maybe a parent or parents are finding themselves in a similar this type of situation. So it's not really a supportive it's more of a torturous route that they have to go down to 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 get them. It, it was certainly be, yeah. it would to be that experience um, in other jurisdictions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I um, just? Uh, I think it's on on. Uh, let's see. Let me find this now again. Um, on. Uh, uh, Okay, can you maybe just talk us around a wee bit about this paragraph five in, the, in our paper, our paper page uh, 20, the strong evidence indicating a later school start is beneficial. Can you say a few words around that? Yes, I think um, that they had identified, a number of studies have identified that there are better mental health outcomes for, um, for example, there's a study done on boys um, and 18 year old boys who had started um, their schooling later um, rather than an earlier school start have demonstrated um, better mental health outcomes um, than those who had started um, at an earlier stage. There's also some, some research demonstrating that um, by the time the children who started their literacy um, their, their learning literacy earlier and um, that benefit that benefit wasn't borne out over time and that the children who started it later caught up quite quickly and that also the children who started later um, had better comprehension with regard to literacy and actually had a better attitude towards literacy and um, a better attitude towards their studies in general. Um, there, was also, there has also been some demonstration with regard to um, exam results and standardised exam scores um, that um, children who start later um, perform better at those standardised secondary, primary and secondary level um, standardised exams. So there's a, there are a number of research studies that would just indicate emotional like, and academic outcomes that it is a, a later school starting age can be beneficial and it's not to say that every child who starts school at four um, is going to be um, you know is going to suffer as a result of that there are plenty of children who are able to manage at four but it's just to be able to provide for those children who will experience adverse outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay Hello. thank you. Thanks, thanks Robin. Thank I see uh, Daniel McCrossan and Malay has a hand raised there. Daniel? 
thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, and uh, thank you to Sinead for her presentation. Uh, Sinead, I'll go straight to a number of questions. Um, there's three points to this. Uh, your report has given us very helpful insight into what happened in some other European uh, countries. And the other education systems you reported on, did any of them start to formally teach reading and mathematics uh, as early as we do in Northern Ireland? That's the first point. Secondly, if they do, uh, did uh, you come across any data in relation to how that education system performed? And finally, your report suggests that there is research evidence that indicates there is little academic gain to be had from commencing formal teaching at a younger age. Uh, I'm conscious that uh, when comparisons are made by the OECD, our primary school children are amongst the highest performing in the world. Can you provide any insight uh, uh, as to why this may be so? Um, so on the first question, I think with the later school starting age, um, which it's usually six and seven, um, those, those, most of those schools or most of those school systems will have a preschool education system attending. So children will, and say, for example, in Finland, their later school starting age is seven, but they will start in preschool at six. Um, so the majority of those schools um, have a preschool education system and children will do that play-based education at that stage and they won't start formal education until the school starting age of six and seven. I don't have um, individual data on each country, but certainly I can provide you with some examples if that would be helpful. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, I can certainly get that. And could you just repeat the last question again there on the OECD? Yeah, um... So we're conscious that the comparisons are made by the OECD uh, or primary school children amongst the highest performing in the world. Why do you think that may be so? That, that our children are among the highest performing? Well, I think because potentially yeah. um, we have, well, I suppose it's proposed that we have a higher standard or that we have an excellent standard of education for primary school. Yeah, but sorry, sorry. The, the main point is that uh, there's a point that you've raised that there's little to be gained from teaching children at such a young age, but yet the OECD says that our children are more, uh, um, are doing a lot better, basically. Yeah, I mean, that is a fair point. I suppose the research that I've identified are from, um, the research that I'm reporting on are from um, reviews into school starting age in European countries. And um, what I, I suppose my point with that was that um, there are a number of arguments for starting school earlier, such as um, it benefits children who are disadvantaged and um, it's popular with parents and that children are academically able. But the research from that review identified that the, the findings, there was little evidence to back that up. Okay, okay. Uh, just another question. You, you informed us there's little evidence to indicate that an early start to school uh, can make up for the any deficiencies in the, the home learning environment of children from disadvantaged backgrounds. This is an important point. Uh, when you refer to a later start at school, not a being to hold back children's progress, are you suggesting our children should stay at home until they are older, or are you suggesting that the educational provision we uh, should be making for them uh, take on a different, less formal form? Um, I suppose I, I'm not really proposing a suggestion. I, I'm, I'm reporting on um, the research that's available. And I think it's that not every school child who um, starts school earlier at four is going to be disadvantaged by starting school. But by allowing children who are going to be, um, I suppose, disadvantaged, that they would be able to have an extra year of preschool education, I think is what um, the general sense, the general proposals are in other jurisdictions, that they would have an extra year of preschool education. Okay, and just to follow on point that, considering the emphasis we are now placing on addressing underachievement in education, did the research carried out by yourselves suggest uh, that there might be an academic benefit for some of our under groups by adopting the less formal approach to education in the earlier years? Yeah, so there is um, international evidence to suggest that this sort of play-based, an extended period of play-based learning where children learn through sort of um, construction play and emotional play and, and those kind of social play, directed play, so it's not, um, you know, totally informal, that that can be beneficial for, um, this is a study carried out by the Department for Education in England on 3,000 children, um, that that um, extended play-based learning can particularly benefit children from um, disadvantaged Okay, and Chair, just a final question. Yeah, final please, thanks. You quoted research uh, that recommended that the schools be informed uh, which of their pupils were born prematurely so that these children can be given extra support. This is quite a topical discussion at present. Uh, and there's quite a lot of people interested in this. 
uh, what sort of support uh, did the research have in mind? Uh, and secondly, what sort of data in this context did the research suggest be shared between the health and education services and uh, to what purpose? I suppose that, um, the, that that research had identified that it wouldn't be necessarily just enough to hold those children back and to keep them back a year later, that children who are born prematurely may have additional support needs and, and cognitive developmental issues. Again, not all children, but some children. Um, and that there may be, it may be worthwhile for the school to have a particular, I suppose, approach for teaching those children if they do have additional needs. And that would be worthwhile um, for, I suppose, educa for education and health um, professionals to coordinate and um, where that child is identified as having some additional needs. Okay, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'll go through the members. Robbie Butler, MLA. Just a reminder, members, that we do need to keep uh, question and answers concise today due to that 12 million cut off. Robbie, thanks. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sinead. I've only got one point to make. I, think, I want to thank you for the report. Um, it's something that a number of us have been talking about for some time now, and it's, it's a quality report. Um, I'm going to make it, I don't know if it's a question or not, Sinead. Certainly what I'm taking from it is that, um, and to pick up on Daniel's point about, um, we do have high achieving pupils, but as another report has pointed out, we, have, we also have a, a, num a number, a subset of, of, of pupils who, for whatever reason, whether it's it's through the, the, the where they live or, or, or when they were born and stuff that aren't getting the same chances. So this isn't really a, a, a point towards a generalised approach. This is looking at the individual pupil, uh, basically, and ensuring that no pupil is disadvantaged based on when they were born or if they were born prematurely. And I think that, for me, that's what I'm getting out of the, the reports and all of the findings that you've got from different countries. So it's less about the actual age. It's more about it, it, the individual position of that child at that time. The interesting point that you maybe picked out on this, if you maybe, if, I don't know if you want to expand on it or not, was in and around the um, special education needs stuff and the, and, and maybe the, um, the the high volume of assessments for children who are born in specific months haven't been given either a, a statement or uh, you know a, some form of, of prescription against them. When maybe that might be not the case. Would that be fair? Um, just repeat that to me again. Sorry, Robbie, I, I, I didn't quite grasp there what you were. The last, the last Robbie, piece? Robbie, Robbie, yeah, Robbie, are you, are you in effect asking if, if there's evidence to uh, show that pupils born prematurely could be disadvantaged without that flexibility around school starting age? That, that was the first point, Chair, yes, yeah. that, that's the first point. But the second point was the bit in the report about SEN and about the, 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 the higher likelihood of a child that was born you know, in the summer or in May or June, to be um, to have a, a, a statement or a, a special education need assessment. And um, so, I think my point there was that children who were born earlier are, are disproportionately being referred to the, um, I suppose, the education authority or the educational psychology service. Um, but it is not necessarily because they have um, they have that special educational need. It could just be that in comparison to their peers, their older peers. And they may appear to have, I suppose, less academic um, attainment and more behavioural or, um, I suppose, emotional difficulties within the classroom, which leads them to be referred to the educational service. But it may just be, in fact, due to the fact that they are younger for their year rather than that they actually have special educational needs. And, and this goes. This probably goes to the point where in, in P1, um, where in our curriculum, for instance, we, we are starting to do sort of the, uh, some, some academic work with maths and English and stuff, whereas yeah. the, a lot of the, the evidence would point towards a play-based approach right up, you know, for, for those earlier years, yeah? Yeah, so the, an extended period of play-based learning, um, I suppose, can be beneficial for a number of reasons. Um, and again, it's not to say that children who are four, all children who are four will struggle with... Um, you know, those numeracy and literacy concepts, but it's to have the flexibility for those children who will potentially struggle and their parents recognise that they're going to struggle to allow them to have some flexibility when they start. Great work. Thank you, Sinead. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robbie. I think you are touching on a, a wider issue and whilst we will focus in on flexible school starting age, giving time restraints, I think wider curriculum provision, early education and childcare provision is, is a is a connected issue to, to what we're looking at today. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? I 
And if, any, if anyone doesn't have questions, that, that's, that's fine. We obviously want to move promptly to the department on this matter. William? Okay, uh, we move to Nicola Brogan, MLA. Yeah, thanks very much for that briefing. It's always really comprehensive um, and really informative. I think it's really it's a good it's good that this we're debating or discussing this today. There's so many people who uh, work very hard to um, get this to force. So I'm really pleased for them. I just have one point or one thing to ask you, Sinead. Um, I think I picked this up right. But I think which there was in part of the 2014 proposal that there was question marks around whether or not parents should have to provide evidence. Um, or it's a choice, whatever. What what was the come up with that there? Um, so the consultation, the, the findings from the consultation was that um, I think it was there was a, a level of disagreement around the type of evidence that should have to be presented. So, for example, the National Education Union would argue that the parents, while any evidence that is available would be helpful. So, if there was evidence from the preschool or whoever that you know the child was having some difficulties and it would be beneficial, that's helpful. But that the parents' view should be given full weight. So if the parent presents the case that their child is, um, you know, would, would need that flexibility around school starting age, that they should be able to, that food should be given full weight and they shouldn't have to go through an arduous process of, um, you know, getting the child assessed and presenting lots of different um, evidence to suggest the child does need that flexibility. So there was, I think there was some disagreement um, that, that parents would prefer, obviously, back in consultation, that they, they shouldn't have to provide volumes of evidence in that regard. Okay, fair enough. That's why I just want to double check that. Thank you, Sinead. And thanks, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. Can I bring in Morris Bradley, MLA? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, thank, thank uh, Sinead very much for her, uh, her presentation. Uh, very informative. I have two very brief questions. Uh, there's a suggestion that children at age four and five should be taught through, through play. Uh, and development rather than formal academic teaching, and some children may not be ready for formal education at that age. So great value has been placed on the model of, of education in Finland. But what age do the, the, the school children start in Finland? And the yeah. second question is, in your, in your opinion, uh, is learning through play rather than starting formal education early in life, uh, and should more emphasis be placed on focus rather than formal education at school starting age. Just your opinions on those two, two points, please. Um, in Finland, they start school at seven, formal education at seven, so they start those sort of literacy, mathematics, science subjects. Um, before that, they very much have that model of um, play-based learning. Um, and I suppose the evidence would suggest that play-based learning um, is, is, I suppose, the most effective way for young children to learn, and it um, develops, it provides them the ability to develop emotionally, socially, and academically. Mm -hmm. um, now, I suppose in the curriculum in Northern Ireland, they have made, um, since 2007, um, you know, that sort of the first two years of schooling in Northern Ireland is more learning through play, um, and they have made, I suppose, allowances for that in the curriculum for teachers to have more um, flexibility how they teach and so a lot of the concepts I suppose that are taught in P1 and P2 are um, through sort of a play-based approach and um, but I suppose the issue is that they still do have um, a significant amount of like literacy and mathematical concepts that children are expected to have by the end of P1 and um, so I suppose research would indicate that um, you know that extended play-based learning is beneficial um, but again it's very much the individual child and um, there's no one size fits all and I suppose some children are able for those to adopt those earlier um, you know mm -hmm. the concept subject-based learning but for some children it may not be appropriate but certainly in the preschool years that's the play-based approach is, um, is, is identified to be beneficial. Mm. Okay thanks very much for that Sinead. thank you very much thanks Chair. Okay Morris thank, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Sinead, thanks so much for the paper and the briefing um, and for all the work that you're doing to help us with a wide range of issues uh, at the moment. 
yeah, you've given us some helpful information there uh, that we'll be able to raise with the department in our, our next session that um, I'm sure you'll want to watch on um, and see um, where we're, what, what stage we're at in terms of um, responding to some of the, the clear evidence uh, that suggests greater flexibility is needed. Thanks, Ned. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Sinead. Chair, the, the department have asked as well that they can share, um, have, have Sinead's evidence shared with them. So, sure. Sure. Content with that, Sinead, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's great. Okay. Thanks, Sinead. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I ask uh, Assembly Broadcasting to uh, remove the witness from the spotlight? Clark, do we need to summarise any actions at this stage or content for us to move into our next agenda item with the Department of Education? Yeah, I think it's a, just a continual conversation on that topic. Yeah. Right, so. okay. Thanks, uh, Clark. Okay, then uh, if I move to agenda item seven which is our Department of Education briefing on flexible school starting age and ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the Department of Education on school starting age flexibility at page 33 and welcome Karen McCulloch, the Director of Curriculum Qualifications and Standards Directorate in the Department of Education, Adrian Murphy, Head of School Age Flexibility Review Team at the Department of Education, Sam Dempster, Head of Curriculum and Assessment Team at the Department of Education, and Melissa Hannock, School Age Flexibility Team at the Department of Education. Can I advise officials that the committee will be glad to give you up to 10 minutes to make an open briefing, followed by questions from the members, which uh, can be answered obviously from across the panel of witnesses. So I'll give you a warm welcome today. Um, this is obviously an issue that the Education Committee um, has been interested in for quite some time. I, I think we've been writing to the department since the return of the Assembly in 2020, and we're really looking forward to receiving an update from you today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chair, for the introductions, and to members for the opportunity to meet with you to outline the work we're doing in terms of flexibility in school starting age. As you're aware, the Minister has announced his intention to introduce uh, legislation to allow flexibility and has asked officials to present him with policy options and advice on the most appropriate way forward. This work is a priority for the Minister and we also appreciate that this is an issue that members are keen to see us progress and that this is likely to be the first of a number of discussions with the committee on this important matter. Today, I'd like to briefly outline the key steps in the policymaking process, giving you a flavour of the work we've taken forward to date and that planned in the coming months. Work to develop the policy options for the Minister began in mid-March, and in line with the high priority the Minister's given the work, Adrian and Melissa have been assigned to work solely on this project with support from Sam, who's the head of the curriculum team. The Education and Training Inspectorate are also actively engaged in the work, providing support through a very experienced um, inspector, and we're working closely with our legislative liaison officer and policy teams across the department. There'll be five main stages to the policymaking process over the coming months. Evidence gathering, development of potential options, formal public consultation, ministerial agreement of the preferred option, and then development of legislation based on that preferred option. Our aim is to ensure that the policy is outward-looking, evidence-informed and delivers benefits for children and young people. To achieve this, the process is designed to be an open, as open and inclusive as possible, with ongoing engagement to ensure that we draw on the knowledge of key stakeholders and learn from experience of what works and what does not. The first stage has been evidence gathering, examining regional, national and international evidence, as well as engaging with key stakeholders. We're gathering data from a wide range of sources and looking at other jurisdictions to learn about their policies, delivery models and the issues that flexibility may present. We listen there to the research briefing and the information being presented reflected a range of the benefits and impacts that we've heard. And we thank, can we thank you for um, agreeing to send the paper to us? 
Particularly important is the engagement with stakeholders, including education practitioners, health professionals, individual parents and interest groups who have a thorough knowledge and understanding of the key issues relevant to the development and impl implementation of an effective policy. Already the team has met with educational policy colleagues across the department and in ETI. There's been engagement with delivery partners, meetings with academic researchers from Stranmillis University College and Ulster University, and discussions with Tiny Life and Bliss. Further meetings are arranged, including meetings with Northern Ireland Teaching Council, NICI, and the Department of Health. The conversations today have provided an insight into the variety of perspective on this, perspectives on this matter and have been invaluable in identifying emerging themes and key issues that we need to consider. We'd like to thank those people who've contributed to this phase of the policy development and who've offered ongoing engagement and support as we take this work forward. Our engagement has underlined the independences of education policy and the need to consider potential options in the context of policies which are already in place to support and develop all children throughout their time in education. For example, preschool education programme, Sure Start, and the foundation stage curriculum in P1 and P2, which uses play as a context for learning, recognising that play is an important factor in the physical, social, emotional and educational development of ch children, and recognises and recognising that young children come to school with a variety of learning experiences and needs. Our engagements further emphasise the importance of us examining in detail how legislation which provides flexibility in school starting age will impact on legislation in other areas of education. For example, consideration will be given to the potential impact which the introduction of flexibility will have on the upper limit of compulsory school age and we'll need to ensure that young people who deferred remain in school to complete all phases of education and long enough to enter public examinations. Similarly, if a child is in a preschool and a decision is sub subsequently taken to defer starting P1, we need to consider what happens to the child during that interim year. How do we ensure that they have an enriching, progressive and suitably challenging educational experience? We're also mindful that policy changes can have unintended as well as intended effects. For example, flexibility in school starting age may place added pressure on families to provide preschool care or restrict workforce participation for parents. We also need to consider the impacts on childcare. There, are, there is also a potential for this to impact on the policies and programmes of other executive departments in thinking in particular of health and the economy. In framing the policy, we are considering the scope in terms of who is best served by flexibility in school starting age, the timing of decisions and potential delivery mechanisms. And we'll use the evidence currently being gathered to consider the educational, financial, administrative and legislative implications of options developed around these key elements. Our plan is to present potential options to the Minister before the end of May and we'll then move forward with a public consultation. After the consultation, when the details of the policy have been finalised and agreed by a minister, the process of taking forward appropriate legislation to implement a firm policy decision will proceed. The minister has already advised it is keen to progress this work at pace, and we are working to do that. It's important to note, however, that the time frame for moving through the legislative stages is not wholly within the control of officials or the minister, and it may be impacted by a significant number of executive bills and private member bills, all vying for assembly time during this mandate. Um, thank you, Chair. That was a very brief overview of the process, and um, as I've mentioned earlier, thank you for the opportunity to engage with you at this policy development stage, and um, we're keen to hear, you know, we're happy to answer questions from the members on the work undertaken today and the process going forward. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, helpful update, and uh, I think there will be a wide range of, of questions, so we'll, we'll get straight to it uh, from myself. Um, you, 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 the department officials and the minister uh, is, are saying that this is a priority for the minister. Um, you say that, that this work was initiated in March 2021. Um, the, the education minister was appointed in January 2020. Notwithstanding the pandemic, how is calling this a priority consistent with that length of time to initiate work? Well, the minister announced in February that he wanted to take this forward and for us particularly to, you know, and, and to develop it at, at pace, and which is what we've done. Staff have been redeployed, you know, around the department to take it, to take it forward. And we are engaging quickly. I mean, we're looking at 
developing these policy options within an eight to ten week time frame, which is you know moving fast in this, but we recognise we need to do that if we're going to um, get the the any policy introduced to the executive in time. I, 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 I think that's fair in terms of the, the pace at which officials are now moving, but I, I think you've you've been given an extremely difficult task to meet the type of time scales that families across Northern Ireland are desperately seeking you to meet. I'm going to come back to the, the time scale issue in a moment, but uh, so uh, we've heard today that Northern Ireland has the lowest school starting age in Europe at, at four years. Um, the most common school starting age internationally appears to be closer to six, and evidence does seem to suggest that school curriculum at four and five should emphasise play and child development rather than formal academic teaching. Does that mean that Northern Ireland is out, wholly out of step with education systems across the world in our school start age and the lack of flexibility around school start age, school start age uh, and the lack of option to defer school start age? I think an important point was made by the researcher when we were speaking earlier that although they, in countries that were mentioned where they start later, they do actually have a, a preschool education programme. And I think that's where we need to make a really important point about the foundation stage curriculum, which is uh, provided at P1 and P2 you know, in, in our schools. It's, um, you know, it recognises that young children come to school with a variety of backgrounds and learning experience and needs. It uses play as a context for learning. And as I mentioned in the opening statement there, you know, recognizing that, it's an important, that play is an important factor in physical, social, emotional, and educational development of children. And then it's as they progress through that foundation stage, them introduced to more formal learning, particularly around literacy and numeracy skills, but at a pace that takes account of their age and level of development. I mean, this curriculum is well embedded. It's been in place okay. since 2007. You know, and our teachers okay. are highly skilled. Okay, the, the, lack of, the lack of flexibility, the lack of option to defer school art, art start age, that is out of step with other education systems, even in the UK and Ireland. Chair, if I can come in on it, yes, yeah. I think that's now been recognised, which is why the Minister's asked us to take forward this, this piece of work. Um, and it's why we're undertaking so much um, background uh, research into that because we want whatever emerges to be evidence-based and robust uh, and okay. provides a suitable answer for parents. Okay, why, why are we in this position? Why, why are we out of step with other education systems in relation to flexible school storage? Our curriculum is a skills-based curriculum, which is unique. It is not the same as other jurisdictions in the UK or elsewhere in Europe. And our curriculum, because it's skills-based, takes account for the young age that our children start school. It's also a continuation from the early years curriculum. There's a continuum of skills-based, play-based learning into our curriculum. But obviously, we are looking at, in our scoping and our research, all the potential ways we can increase awareness of the skills-based curriculum to stakeholders. And obviously, seeing if that is being played out. Our teacher training also includes teachers are shown how to help children develop educational benefits through the play-based curriculum in years one and two, which should be a continuation from early years. Okay. The, there was a Department of Education consultation as long ago as 2014 in relation to flexible schools starting age and 94% of respondents agreed that parents should be able to defer school start age by one year. Why are we undertaking another consultation? Chair, I and think what was, and what, was what, what has been done to progress the outcome of the previous consultation? Chair, I, th I think the main difference this time uh, is there may be uh, more potential options that we want to put to the Minister. The consultation which ran from December 14 to March 15 focused on one question only uh, and that was deferral uh, in exceptional circumstances and the plan was to allow the Education Authority to create panels to look at cases on an individual basis. We're, we're now looking at uh, on a, as a wider scope in terms of whether or not we introduce flexibility in terms of amending, for example, the compulsory school age um, definition and other options. Um, and those, those are all potential options at this point. We haven't put them to the Minister formally yet. Um, but, but the main difference is we're looking at, at the wider picture, not just that single issue of 
um, setting up a panel to look at cases in exceptional circumstances. There what other um, sorry, um, Chair. Um, there's also been a modernity since 2014 and 15. There has been advancements in the educational landscape, and there have been initiatives such as the Three Plus Initiative, which is run with the Department uh, in association with the Department of Health. So all of that needs to be taken into account when we look at okay. it in today. Okay. What other options are you considering? Are you considering particular categories such as birth months, premature births? What other categories? We are looking at the, the scope. Yeah, we're looking at that at, at the scope in its entirety in terms of what the evidence is showing, uh, what children would benefit from that. So we're not focusing particular. Well, we, we we're looking at the evidence in particular around prematurity, but there are other groups of children that uh, our colleagues within the education system and indeed within health are saying would benefit from this flexibility, and that's why we're looking at this in a much wider scope than might have been looked at before. So you might have groups the likes of newcomer children who have also got uh, poorer educational outcomes than their compatriots, and also looked after children, adoptees. Um, or, or children who've got other SEN type programs or issues. You know, we want to make sure that whatever policy that we put forward uh, covers the entirety of children that might benefit from such a policy and that we don't uh, fix something for one particular group when others would benefit from it as well. Okay, thanks for that. Um, you, you mentioned one issue being what provision would take place in, a, in an interim year that there would be added pressure on preschool care and child care. Um, how much of a problem does, our, does the inadequate framework provided by the Department of Education for early education and child care place on you in terms of how flexible you can be with school start age? What we'll be looking at is in terms of scope, is in terms of the scope, is the, then the scale of that, you know, if I mean, it was interesting to hear the information that Scotland, because I know Adrian's been looking at that, you know, about what proportion of children this may impact on, and then if they're not go, going to be in school, you know, how do we ensure that they are getting, uh, you know, good support during that interim year? So really, what we're looking at is the the scale, and then we'll be able to work out how would that be managed, you know, for the. Okay. Place. Okay, you, you've helpfully set out the, the timeline uh, in your briefing paper today, um, and, and you've referenced matters being outside the Minister's control. Um, I've seen legislation move fairly rapidly through the Assembly when it, it, it needs to be. Uh, are you going to have a flexible school starting age in place for the academic year 2022-2023? I, I think that that would be a really difficult one to achieve because even if we this is put in, we get the legislation through, the systems then need to be put in place to make this, you know, operational, and that would have to be done to coincide with, you know, the admissions process as well. So I think there would be it would be challenging. Yes, sure. <coughs> the, the admissions process for primary school typically takes place up to the end of January. Um, so anything would need to be through by January 2022 in order for it to be effective for those children entering P1 in September 2022. And why can't we achieve that? Would you, if, I mean, if you look at the legislative timetable, if we introduce this to the executive in October, and if you follow the normal legislative process with you know each all of the stages that are set out and the likely timeframes we've been advised of, um, that would possibly take us to September 2022. There are things we can look at for collapsing that, but some of some of that is, again, as I say, out, dependent on the executive and the committee as well. I, I'll, I'll move on to... Sorry, go ahead. And in terms of how we can speed up that legislative process. I think it's just uh, important to make that point that there are, as I understand it, 40-plus potential bills hitting the Assembly uh, uh, you know, from September onwards, and uh, that hits on the capacity of the Office of Legislative Council to draft the bills and the Assembly itself to scrutinise those bills. So it, it, we are very much, it's, it's out with the control of the department at that point, uh, and, it, and, and it makes it a, a, an issue where it's about the priority of resources to make such legislation pass. Well, what other legislation does the Education Department have on its books that 
is going to be so hard to get this education through or this legislation through because we haven't seen any yet. No, this is the legislation. I think the point Adrian was making, Chair, was that um, the totality of the bill is, is around 40, so it's not the capacity of officials here or the committee to do this. It's the, the capacity of OLC and others to um, work on so many pieces of legislation. Okay, I'm keen to bring other members in, but I, I think one of the key issues that will develop uh, in the course of today and our engagement with you will be wanting to scope why that January um, uh, legislation can't be achieved. And you'll not find this committee wanting in, in terms of playing our part to achieve such a date. I'm aware there are families across Northern Ireland who desperately want to see that flexible school starting age introduced in time for that 2022-23 academic year. Let me bring in colleagues then. Um, can I bring in uh, Pat Sheehan, MLA, Deputy Chairperson? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, folks, uh, and thanks for your presentation. I just want to stay for a while on the timeline, and, and let's take a step back first of all. Um, how long have you as officials been working on this particular issue? Since mid-March. And when, when do you expect to have a paper on the Minister's desk? Within the next three weeks. Yep. That, the policy options, then a, deci a decision on what we take forward. So there would there, there'd be a paper on the Minister's desk before the end of, the end of May? Yep. Yeah. And... Um, you were talking about October before legislation could come in front of the Assembly. Why is there that uh, gap there between the end of May and October? Uh, for consultation? Yeah, there'll be a formal consultation in between, um, which, will, which will either be eight weeks, if we can compress it, but more likely 12 weeks. And when would you anticipate that starting? Our aim is if, to go... I mean, if we get the minute, get the paper to the minister in agreement, that would be from, from mid June. Now, then we have to be very conscious that that takes us over the summer, so that we would be saying that would be a twelve-week consultation period then to allow for that summer period. So that's the that would be our aim. Okay, so um, you 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 have only been tasked to work on this since mid March. Is that what you're telling me? Well, the minister made his formal announcement, I think, during orals in, in February. Um, and since then, yes, um, with the team has been put together um, okay. to take this forward. OK, so really what you're telling is that it's, it's highly unlikely, in your view, that there's going to be legislation on this issue before the end of this mandate. It's going to be challenging. Is it possible? Yeah, I think, you know, it is technically possible, uh, but that has to bypass some of the role of the committee in terms of scrutiny. Um, you know, the, the timetable that, that, that we would outline, once we go from consultation, uh, we then have to get the executive to agree that it forms part of a legislative programme. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're hearing the views of the committee, we would be hopeful that that would take place quite quickly, but we would be mindful that the executive uh, can take time to agree that. It then has to get a... a draft bill uh, prepared, and it doesn't start getting drafted until we've got executive agreement. Uh, and then once we've got a draft bill prepared, you look to the, bring that through to the Assembly. You can use an accelerated passage, which would take things through in 10 to 12 days, but that has to bypass the, the role of the committee in scrutinising this legislation, where the committee has to accept that uh, the legislation as it is delivers what they want and what you guys want. Uh, and, you know, we recognise that accelerated passage is really frowned upon and we understand from the Speaker that it would only be viewed in extremis and it's not the position of the Assembly that they want to do that. That's, that's about the only route where you can take the legislation package from something like uh, a three to four month period down to 10 to 12 days. And that's where we know you can take it through. But it comes with the concept, the consequence of reduced accountability and transparency through the committee. OK, thanks for that. And in, in terms of which children will qualify for flexible school starting age, what, what criteria do you anticipate being used? I can have a chat to speak about that. Um, 
We've looked at a whole range of potential options here where we are looking at prematurity and looking around the research around prematurity, and we've seen some of that from the researcher earlier on, uh, in terms of the number of premature births in Northern Ireland and whether, you know, at what point do you define that as, uh, you know, you could, we, we potential options where we could set criteria at X number of weeks of prematurity or uh, the, the two months before the cutoff date. But we also want to make sure that we're not excluding a whole range of other parents. We don't want to move the cliff from uh, the, you know, the, the date that we have at the moment, two months earlier, we want to look at a potential where there are other people who are born before that or who've got other educational needs. And this is why it's important that we consider the, the looked after children, newcomer children and any other uh, potential there. So that it's wide, it's in the scope and the right people benefit from this. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, I mean, we, we listened to evidence a couple of weeks ago from both the Education Authority and the Children's Law Centre uh, about the the process for getting uh, statutory assessments uh, and the evidence being used in those assessments. And what we heard was that usually it's the parents who know best and often that evidence that was being presented by parents was being disregarded by the education authority. And I'm just fearful that we could have a similar situation here where parents know the developmental stage of their own children uh, and uh, their requests to have the school starting age delayed may, be not, may not be taken account of. Is there going to be any sort of process whereby parents, you know, without any medical evidence and so on, uh, or without their children falling any, into any of those categories you've mentioned. Is there going to be any room for parents to, to have their evidence listened to in the way I've described? Absolutely. It'll be led by parents, but we also have to recognise that uh, whilst uh, you know we, we have been approached by quite a number of parents with clear developmental needs for their children, any system that we create will be... Uh, uh, open to um, abuse and we therefore have to have a system where we don't allow people to uh, simply defer the school starting age because they happen to believe that that will give them an academic advantage for their child at the transfer to stage. So we need to have something in there which is, is not going to create more inequality across our system. So there needs to be something that is a little bit beyond parental evidence. And one of the things that you, you, you in the committee uh, evidence from a couple of weeks ago was the link between the education system and the child health system. And that's something that, that has been brought to our attention very clearly throughout the sort of engagement sessions that we've been having. And we'll be engaging more with our colleagues in the Department of Health around their position where they want to expand the child health system so that there's no cliff edge again where you, uh, children finish off the child health system at age two to three, that they keep having developmental checkups. And these children, full stop, children full stop, have better developmental signposts and they can be picked up earlier and picked up earlier in terms of their child development and physical development so that they can be picked up into the, whether it's the SEN process or early conversations with nursery schools and primary schools so that this isn't a, oh my goodness, my little child has to enter into P4 and it's really challenging. Parents know this at a much earlier stage and the system, the system in its widest, both education and health, need to be able to know that earlier. So we want to work at that. And it's not just about the legislation. We want to work at that other element of the policy to try and address this. We don't want to fix a problem if we can address it much earlier in the stage of their child's health. Okay, think, Pat, okay. Sorry, Pat, if I can just add that very, very briefly. And I think the phase we've just been through in terms of gathering evidence... Uh, and talking to Strand Mellis and talking to Ulster University and talking to Tiny Life and Bliss and other groups and we're continuing out over the next couple of weeks. I think that's why it's so important. So the evidence that we have is thorough and robust and uh, can provide outcomes that the parents are looking for. Okay, Pat. Hey, can I move on just to, to one quick point, uh, one other point altogether? Yeah, uh, final, final point, Pat, thanks. Okay, yep. and, and the flexibility around school starting age is, uh, is one measure that can uh, significantly support children in their early years. Um, but if we're going to take the next step, 
there needs to be an in-depth look at the whole funding scheme. And as it currently stands, greater resource is allocated to post-primary, whereas the evidence suggests that greater funding at early years has much more of an impact. Uh, so is there any uh, new analysis or a new look being taken at how our schools are funded? But I would imagine that would be part of the fundamental review of education, which will take place in the in the next mandate, because it's looking at the totality of, of education provision. Yeah. But there's nothing happening at the minute? Now, as I understand it, there was a, a look at the common funding formula over the past 12 to 18 months. Um, I was involved in some early meetings in that. I'm, I'm not aware of where that is, but we can back we can come back to the committee with, with an answer of whether there's work ongoing in that, if that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks. I don't think there is. Um, Adrian, you, you made a comment there. I'd just like to um, you respond to briefly. You, you said you wanted to uh, guard against parents seeking to gain an, uh, an academic advantage at transfer test stage. Why, why would deferral of school starting age permit an academic advantage at transfer test stage? Uh, very fundamentally, you, would, you you when you defer, you enter P1 a year later. So you at, at the transfer test stage, you are a year older than most of your peers, uh, and a year can make quite a difference in terms of academic performance at that stage. Um, we know that, as I understand it, the transfer tests do some um, age-based analysis of that, but you know, we want to make sure that there's nothing within our system that's going to give an additional academic advantage to that. And we will be engaging with the transfer test um, providers at some point when we when we start to work through some of our policies here. What Thanks, what do what do the transfer test providers do in terms of age, Adrian? I, it's not my art. Uh, Chair of come in on that. They, they do um, a standardization of their scores, so they are age uh, weighted. So if you're a younger pupil, you will get that will be taken into account. But I think the point Andrew was trying to make is it's, it's just another example of, of one of those things that we need to look at in terms of developing this policy. And what what way uh, what what way is that age standardization overseen by the statutory department of education? It's not, it's overseen by the providers. Okay. Chair, it's just, it is, it's, 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 just one, it's just one example of the sort of unintended consequences. We, I mean, we've also been advised of, uh, again, as you, you know, we're thinking of, of, of very challenging for three, four and five year olds at this point, but they, they become teenagers. So you end up having uh, children at age 14 who are, some of their class will be 15 and the, the girls will reach puberty at a different age. Boys will be physically different at that age. And you, what we don't want to do is to have a, a, a change in our, our cohorts that will actually uh, worsen some of the mental health issues that our children face at that age. So it's just to be, okay. you know, the totality of the policy needs to be the, yeah. the, it, it seems to have passed by that the Assembly just voted to... Um, abolish the use of academic testing at that age that might that might make uh, life easier for you guys in terms of your uh, deferral uh, start age as well then okay can i bring in robin newton mla please thanks thank you chair can i thank the team uh for being with us uh today uh, i suppose that this is uh you know, it's something I've been interested in for some time now, and you kind of think, you know, um, child born premature, yes, flexible school starting age should should just be allowed, and then you start to realise that there are much wider problems uh, than that. Just uh, what seems to be a, a common sense approach. Maybe can I pose a, a just a few short questions? I think they will be uh, to the. Uh, to the panel, if, if we want to be supportive of flexibility, and I think there is generally a, an ethos in, in what the panel uh, said to us, they're looking for flexibility, they have a positive approach, they want to be supportive uh, in generally. So in the event that a parent feels that their child should be delayed by, by a year, 
there's no option to the parent at this stage unless there are um, exceptional circumstances. So what would the process be that a parent has to go through to, to say that their child should be held back a year? And what type of evidence would they have to present for, for that to be granted? So is that about now, Robin, if they're in the system now? If, if yes, the situation yes. as it is now, yes. Yeah. Because at the moment there is no process there to, you know, to um, a, apply for to defer school starting age. But what we are saying to parents who approach us is that the best thing to do is to go and talk to the school that your child has applied to and have a good discussion with them about the arrangements they have in place for the transfer into school and the supports that can be put in place when they move into year one. There's also very um, there's also guidance that was mentioned by the researcher the, this morning on school starting age that's produced by the EA and that can be a useful source of information for them. What happens is when you, you go into the school, um, there can be uh, decisions can be made then by the school about whether a child should be retained or in fact moved on in the school year. And that is a decision that's made by the Board of Governors, but with taking account of the views of the parents and of the principal and with reference to the EA. So once you're in the school, you can have that, that conversation with them and look at that possibility of, of say, retaining or moving on. Mm -hmm. And, that, and then that, the advice is that then that is reviewed every year within the school to see is the child still in the right place or does that need to yeah. be amended? And Robin, as Karen says, I mean, there's there's no formal process at the minute. There's yeah. nothing in, in, in the legislation that allows for deferral, but it's a small number of parents do that um, each year anyway, uh, and they make they, they choose to make their own arrangements. Um, but it is important to emphasise that whatever arrangements they make, um, it has to be age appropriate to the ability and to the ability of, of the child. So, so let, let me see if I can get this right. <clears throat> Mum or dad goes to the school and says, I think my child should be held back a year. School say, that's not possible, but we will give you support. Is that the... Yeah. <laughs> that would happen. And then the, the other point is, if, if you have a child and you decide not to get them to start in P1, you then and then yes. you decide you want them to go into school at a later stage, the usual position is that they will join with their chronological age group so if you're holding yeah. back, yeah, they will join into P2. So that yeah. but you have to contact the school um, and to make sure that they have spaces available for you to join at that point. And mm -hmm. then, as I say, once you're in the school, then you can have that discussion about whether they should, whether if they're in the right year group. But they need to be in the school to do that. Yeah. Okay. So mum and dad say... No, we're holding a child back for a year. <clears throat> and I think um, you had so, someone in your opening remarks had indicated that you would want to know what would happen to the child in that year. That I think the word enriching educational experience was, was used. Uh, how, how would mum or dad provide that kind of evidence then? Well, it's just that, in, I mean, in law, the, the duty to ensure a, a child um, receives suitable education falls on the parents, you know, in law. Yeah. So, I mean, if they decide to take out, it's, it's, it's for, it does put that onto the parent to, decide, you know, to be assured that that is the right course of action for the child. And if a parent notifies the EA that they have chosen to provide their own education for the child because they wish to defer them from starting year one, and they're going to make their own provisions. The EA can provide a lot of support for um, homeschooling or any other schooling that the parent may choose. So there is other availability of support there from the EA for those parents if they're looking for ways to how can I support this child if they've chosen to make a different decision in that first year rather than letting them join the school. And I think it comes back to Karen's first point is that it has to be an informed decision and the, and the advice we've been given to those parents who are thinking about it I think I've thought about it over the last couple of years is speak to the school principal of you know, the school that you're, you were applying to or were thinking of applying to and if possible speak to the foundation um, stage teacher as well to find out how the child might transition from preschool 
into foundation stage um, and, and, and find out more about the foundation stage and the play-based learning that happens in there. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting, you know, I, I must enroll my friend in school. That's my, that's what I'm required to do as a parent. But I can choose to delay it and provide an enriching experience of school, uh, educating experience at home. Is that, is that what it boils down to? One or the other of those but questions? If, if, yes. if the parents at that stage think it's the best thing for their child, they can do that. They can educate at home or look for other things. And I think an important point was made by Melissa there that you can then, you know, you can register with the EA to say that you are doing that for your child and then they will be able to, you know, be there to provide yeah. support if you choose that. Uh, well, I think we will recognise the number of home of parents who choose to homeschool is very low. And it's also a choice that might uh, uh, disadvantage uh, the economically disadvantaged in the sense that not everybody will have the, the capacity to do that. And, yeah. and therefore, any policy that you have, we want to make sure that we, again, that there's equality across that. Um, so there's a recognition that what we have, uh, uh, if anybody chooses not to, to, to put their child through into P1, uh, is not ideal. However, I think we would come back to the point that the foundation curriculum already copes with children who have a, a, a 12 month gap between them and um, from the ones who, who are at the youngest to the oldest and teachers will already do that within the curriculum and and the advice that we get uh, from many of the educational practitioners is that uh, conversations with those concerned parents uh, assuage a lot of those fears because those parents will be that those children will be uh, taught with peers who are also equally young and will have some support for them. Uh, that's what happens in, in the majority of the position in other jurisdictions. Even Scotland at the max have around 12 to 13 percent of their children who do there. Uh, there are other jurisdictions in uh, across the world who have much more. In Ireland it's far, far lower and in England it's far, far lower. Um, yeah. We're talking about a very, very small number of children across our jurisdiction. Okay, okay, Robin, uh, final question, please. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Charlie, just let me finish with this. Uh, I, I do accept, uh, and my 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 own experience really is around where there's a premature birth, and as science and technology and our own knowledge moves on, we are more than likely to see a, a greater number of premature births. So. I, 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 I'm struggling with this. You mu you must have your child in school, but if you can offer an enriching educational experience in your own home, that I, I'm struggling with that, particularly in the area of where uh, a child has been born uh, significantly premature. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan, MLA, please. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you can hear me okay, yeah? Yes, Daniel, go ahead. I had to switch devices over just, Chair, because the uh, the tablet kept going off. No problem. Uh, I just want to revert back to the discussions around timelines, and I have some concern, probably more about the approach of the department than anything else, because I don't believe there's been suitable uh, or justifiable explanation as to why it has taken from 2014, when Minister John died at the time, uh, brought this about uh, until March when he's actually uh, started to do anything. Can you explain what, what was done between 2014 and March? Or why has nothing been done between that time? 2014-15, so John O'Dowd was here and the consultation went ahead. I understand then that that didn't progress to a legislation because of the... Sorry, I think at that time it was a time issue, Daniel. Um, there were a number of bills at the... Uh, the department were trying to get through it at that stage. Uh, so there was the shared education bill, there was the SEND bill, um, special education lead bill, um, and the anti-bullying bill. So there were a couple of other bills in draft, including, well, not in draft, um, a couple of other proposals, including the deferral uh, and other reform of the general teaching council, for example. Those last two um, were not considered priorities at that point. Uh, the minister at that time wanted to put through those, the other bills that I mentioned, and so they went through. Um, so the others fell 
at, at the end of that at, at the end of that mandate. So, are you saying then just uh, just to address that point that you raised? Are you saying that the minister instructed then that no further advancement would be made on that particular piece of legislation because of other uh, legislative priorities that's in correct. the department? And he, that's correct. And I wrote to the executive and the committee at that time. Was so, John O'Dowd, John O'Dowd, the minister of the day, instructed that's, you not to proceed at that time. Yeah, that reflected the minister, minister's priorities at the time. That's interesting. Okay. And that, that would have happened across I mean, that would have happened across other departments as well because it was such a tight timeline. Yeah, yeah. Um okay, okay. Well, I suppose coronavirus has really shone a very bright light on, on, on these issues, as you can imagine. I have a number of questions here, uh, and I'll, I'll jump at them at points so uh, you can address them then as a whole. Uh, firstly, uh, you said amendments to existing legislation may be needed to introduce flexibility for parents who wish to delay formal schooling for their children. Uh, when you say may be needed, and I quote that, do you envisage possible solutions to this issue that will not require legislative change? And a further point to that, if so, what are they and what uh, will they enable parents to do that they can't currently do? Um, I think it, it's a will. If it's going to change, and apologies, that you know that should be a will, because um, DS, DSO advice was previously sought on this, and it confirmed no. that any, any change to the prescribed school starting it, including deferral, would require a change to primary legislation. And then the, the advice was it, we also would need to look at other pieces of legislation, particularly around the compulsory school leaving age as well. And, so the, it's, and in the preschool definition yes, as well. And, 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 and the school transfer age, and, and I would say transfer with a small T there. Yeah. So yeah. there are quite a few pieces of legislation, and I think that yeah. there are so many interdependencies. And, you know, uh, the, if you pull up one piece of legislation, it impacts on others, and that's part of the process that we're going through here, looking at the legislative impacts, because we have to be very careful to make sure that we don't make a change here, you know, in the school starting age, that later impacts. So if you're a child and you defer, and then you go to the end of school, and you're allowed to leave at 16, and you turn 16 when you're in year 11, you'd be able to leave, and what we want to do is make sure that you know, that try and safeguard 12 years of compulsory education and that children have the opportunity to sit for public examinations at the end. Uh, and then uh, similarly in the preschool, it yeah. impact. And I would I'd also add, Daniel, it's, it's not just our legislation. Uh, whilst we, we have looked at that, uh, compulsory school age impacts on further education college legislation within the Department for Economy. And it, impact, it may well impact on benefits legislation in terms of when you become, um, you know, uh, sort of, an adult and therefore entitled to benefits, etc. There's, a, there's a, it's as, as Karen, the the, the 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 allegory of using a piece of string is is really very important here. It's it, we we we're the base bit that's in underneath quite a lot of other things here. Okay, just a, uh, another question. You also suggest that any delay in formal schooling carries with it a range of wider implications. So a number of points in relation to that. What are these implications and who will be affected? In particular, what would the implications be for primary schools? Secondly, do any of them have resource implications? And if so, will you be costing them uh, when you present the options to the minister of the day? Uh, uh, thirdly, are you considering revisiting the foundation stage curriculum to strengthen its emphasis on play-based learning? And a final point to that. How advanced are you with your review of the potential effects on existing legislation? Uh, when do you think you will have this completed? And is your tentative timetable uh, realistic? Uh, a lot of focus on timetables. Okay, I, have, I think I've covered already that the, you know there are wider implications in terms of that uh, issue around transfer between uh, uh, primary and post-primary, whether that physically means a transfer test or just transfer. Uh, you know, do you transfer with your chronological age or do you transfer at the age of the cohort that you're already within? Um, different education systems do it differently. Uh, Scotland, transfer with your cohort that you're in and ignore that, but others change at the chronological age. And we recognise that, that we've had some evidence from uh, England where uh, we it has created problems at transfer where uh, parents have been required and obliged to move a child from what would be the equivalent of P6 into the first year of a post-primary because of the view of their local authority. We need to go through all of that. And once you do that, then you've got, if you have a, depending on the numbers that uh, actually choose or eventually become through and deferral, 
Uh, if it's 10 percent, then that's still, you know, two and a half to three thousand children in Northern Ireland in every single year who are going to be older than their cohorts. And that changes the dynamic of the classroom. So we want to make sure that we can look at the teaching practice that's available for that and have a look at some of the work that then will be done around the other issues that I've talked about around puberty, about bullying, about mental health, about self-harm, about mental image, that we're not fixing one problem to create another one at the sort of post-primary stage. And we have very limited evidence as yet from Scottish system in terms of what they're dealing with, because their system has only been in place for a few years. Um, and again, we, there are other systems that have, have been looking at this. Uh, there's an example in Australia where in some states you can defer just by choice. So you've got 25% of children, again, different uh, age for their cohort. So that makes a very, very different schooling experience. We want to make Daniel, sure. if, I, if, I, if I just come in briefly again, um, I realise you, you cite a wide range of issues there, to be fair to you, Adrian, but uh, it's, it, it is hard to overlook the fact that uh, a, a non-statutory uh, test-based transfer system for a wide range of our schools in Northern Ireland that the Assembly has just recently voted to abolish is, uh, is impacting upon our considerations for flexible school starting age, that's quite remarkable. Yep, but Chair, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a point. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Just to make that point, we're not talking about a transfer test. We're talking about transfer between primary to post. No, no. You you, you talked yeah, about transfer tests earlier, but I've acknowledged there's a wide range of issues yeah. you're referring to as well. Yep. And can I just pick up on the point that uh, Dan, you're asking about the foundation stage? Go ahead Look, there. I think this has been a really important point that's come out in the discussion about people's awareness of what that foundation stage curriculum offers and that it is a play-based curriculum you know and as, as Melissa said it's a continuation from the early years curriculum um, and it it uses play as a context for learning you know so and, it, and it's well embedded and our teachers are highly skilled in delivering that and you know and creating okay. across the whole age range um, of, of children within that Okay, thanks for that. That final sure. question, Daniel, please. Yep. Yeah, just a follow up point. Uh, currently, there's provision uh, uh, within schools uh, to retain a child for an additional year. Will that be reviewed uh, in the current legislation? Uh, that that is practice within the school, I think, isn't it? I mean, and yeah, that's, yeah, that's that, what happens that, that's, at the moment. That's so that can be done at any time in the school yeah. years as the child's moving. Yeah, the board, the board of governors has have that power at their discretion. Yeah. I'm asking yeah. in this legislative in this legislation, uh, as it progresses, will that be reviewed? Will will the decision that a school can take to retain a child for next year be reviewed? Well, well, Daniel, in terms of um, post-primary, if, if I could start with that first, there, there is a definition of school transfer age, and I tell you what, it's, it's not about the test, it's about transfer for all kids. So there's a definition in there. Um, if we were to change the definition, for example, of compulsory school age, it could impact on that. Uh, and within, within the definition of school transfer age, that's where the provisions to um, either put a child forward a year or hold a child back a year, are contained. So yes, we would need to look at that in the round. In terms of primary school, it's a less formal um, position. It, it's not set in legislation and it's, it's down to the boards of governors to make that call in the interest of the child. Okay. okay. You know, ju just been a big chair to this year. You know, th there's many, many parents would argue that their children have been so badly affected as a result of COVID and their educational opportunities affected. Uh, could there be a situation where we have larger numbers of children that are retained for a further year, given how this pandemic has affected them? I'm, I'm not aware of any numbers on that and haven't seen yeah. And I know that was something that was discussed. I know the minister discussed it with the committee as well. You know, when there was discussion about should that happen on a whole scale basis and that wasn't the, pos the position, you know. That... Where, where we're finding some pressure points would be um, from preschool into year one. And from year seven into year eight, they're asking for um, a deferral or, or to be held back at that point. We're, we're not getting it in year so much. Yeah. Um, Chair, just to say, um, children in their preschool year this year, they have still engaged in remote and face-to-face -face learning. So for yeah. this, by uh, COVID, and maybe you know time spent out of the the preschool provision or classroom, wherever they may be. The preschool education settings were still required to give remote learning and they were actually supported by doing that by the department of education through an initiative um so 
those children haven't missed out. It was either remote at home or it happened face to face, depending on the timing of this year. Yeah, yeah sorry, okay. Chair, but yeah, final, final, final point, point, please, Daniel. Thanks. In a perfect world, uh, in a perfect Northern Ireland, that would be the reality. It was far from it. As you know, there's many, many reasons as to why children could not benefit from remote learning uh, broadband, uh, the access to broadband provision being quite poor in many areas, particularly my constituency, and also a lack of devices within the home, and also the social uh, socioeconomic factors that have affected uh, children uh, at home as well. So learning remotely uh, has come under considerable criticism, uh, and rightly so, and has shone a bright spotlight on where the gaps emerge, and that, that it's where the department you focus their energy going forward. But I, I take okay. your point, in a, in a perfect world, yes, but unfortunately that's not been the case. Yes, okay. there also Thanks, the Daniel. Provisions provided as well, but again, our educational experts, our teachers, will be able to differentiate with our play-based curriculum when they bring those children in. They'll look at their individual needs and requirements and differentiate accordingly. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks, Thank Daniel. You. Thank Robbie, you. Robbie Butler, MLA, please. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, guys. Um, really, really good discussion to be having today. Um, and many times on the, in our committee meetings, and when you guys come, it's maybe not good news, but this is good news. So let's, let's put that out there at the outset. It really is good news. Um, and I, for one, uh, I'm grateful um, that the Minister has prioritised this. However, we'll go back to the point that um, uh, Daniel made with regard to um, the previous um, investigations into this. And I have a real concern, genuine, real concern. And my concern is this, I'm only after literally tweeting a, a, a UTV piece from 2013 where uh, parents were meeting with the Department of Education to flesh this out. It went down to uh, the Minister's timetable and the Minister decided that it couldn't be done in mandate. But today you're coming and saying this cannot be done in mandate. What's the difference? Why could it not be done in that mandate and it couldn't be brought forward, but it can now be done in the, uh, not, not done in this mandate, but in the next mandate. And I'll tell you why I'm asking this. And it goes back to where the chair was at the very early earliest point. And I think even um, Patsy, and to be fair, asked about, is there any other ways that we can do this? Um, maybe not accelerated passage. And I'll tell you why. We sat, uh, we, we sat for three years with no government here in Northern Ireland. Now, can anybody hand on heart here, whether an MLA or not, and say that there will be a storming here next year or not? Now, there is. And I hope those days are gone. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we, we, we are tied to something here at the moment which is kind of unstable. So I'm asking you guys, what has changed between 2013-14, that mandate, this mandate? And if we can't do this through normal legislative process, what can be put in place even in a temporary measure for parents whose uh, children could be starting school in September 2022 if they can't rely on the politicians of Northern Ireland to deliver for them? I, I think the issue is, Robert, that there isn't legislative base to do anything different. You know, they, there isn't an option at the moment in legislation to defer. So what we've described um, earlier is the process that the, the parents would have to go through, you know, where you would be applying to a school and having that conversation with the school or get or you, you defer and then the child joins the school in the, with a chronological age group in P2 and then you have the discussion with the school about whether they should be retained or where they should, you know, be, uh, which year group they should be educated with. But I think the, the key thing and we keep, you know, saying is to en ensure you have that conversation with the educationists so the, uh, people understand exactly what is on offer in the school and how any needs might be addressed, you know, even to get that reassurance and then at that stage make the decision of what is be in the best interest of the child. I mean, the reason that we want this is that, so that the, the, the parent doesn't have to go through this process. Do you know that there is a... Uh, yeah, it recognises that there are occasions when it might be in the best interest of a child to, to defer. Uh, and Robbie, can I... I've just come in at that point. You, you asked an earlier question to, to the researcher about the OECD. And, and how that sort of ties in when we have a very early starting age in comparison to the rest of uh, the sort of European education systems, in fact, world systems. Uh, um, what, we, what we have found uh, to date is that there's no real correlation. There's, no, there's nothing which says that if you start at seven or start at five or start at four in terms of your formal age, that doesn't make any difference to where you are within the PISA educational rankings. So our system does very well within that. 
so that the finished system, but actually about the curriculum and the development that happens within that. We've looked also at sort of GCSE um, performance of people by their birth age. Uh, and, and actually, by the time we get to the outcome of our system, there's very, very, very limited impact of birth age on your GCSE performance. So our system in itself it takes account of what are already, there are about two or three percent of, of children born every year are born within that early prematurity and born within a lot of other vulnerable groups, etc. But by the end of our education system, teachers using the tools that they have on the education and practice, even that out. And that's fundamentally what our educationalists are telling us, that are even today, it, whilst it is a challenge, and, and you can look at the differential between a child born at, at 28 weeks and a child born at, at the right age going into P1, by the time they leave P7, that differential has been evened out. And by the time you get to GCS, that has been evened out. I'm going, to, I'm going to come in here. Aiden, so why, are we, why are we standardising at P7 then? I'll let that go, Robbie. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you don't mind, Chair, if you don't mind Chair, this is an important one because I, I'm not going to dispute what Aidan's saying, but what I'm going to say is school isn't just about academic attainment. And this is this goes down into the yeah. whole evaluation of education. What is indisputable is that the, uh, the emotional well-being and other instances uh, and that socialisation is actually something that schools do too. Uh, and that, uh, when you spend any time with tiny life, for instance, and, and uh, you know, families of the pre-born babies um, they, they do face early years difficulties and yes there is comfort to know that, that over a period of time these things can equal out in terms of academic stuff however other studies would show that it's not just the academic pressures on young people um, and we've got the, obviously the mental health and well-being picks. I mean after the, my, my daughter was born five weeks early um, so she was uh, and, and she's brilliant and to be fair she was one of those children who didn't need the additional help but I also know of other um, family uh, friends who have had children early who would have actually benefited from it just for whatever the circumstances and individual. And this goes back, I suppose, guys, to my point to the researcher. This we cannot treat each child the same. It is totally different, and there needs to be flexibility because every child is different, regardless. Um, and, and I think Adrian, you'd say you know, children even mature at different stages, and there's a lot of stuff outside of school which has you know, socio-economic or socio-environmental um, aspects. They've got the physical, the mental health, and the well-being stuff. And the real benefit in, in this will be a, a well-designed piece of legislation and framework which actually recognises each child's individuality and allows for me uh, and collaboration with the parents and the schools to decide what is best for that child. Um, and I do accept that there needs to be inbuilt flexibilities with regard to transfer and then um, possibly uh, a school leaving age as well. And that will kick into uh, further education. So, guys, I actually am not, I'm not going to I'm not going to ask any questions because I'm excited about this. But my, my concern uh, genuinely is in the ability to deliver this um, uh, by September 22 to allow those children the best start. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks for that. William Humphrey, MLA. time and your uh, your exchange with this morning it's, it's very valuable and, and like others I welcome this um, and perhaps one of the things that the committee might do uh, along with yourselves <clears throat> and the minister and, and, uh, and indeed those who decide what comes to the floor of the uh, between now and the end of the mandate is we can possibly get the delivery that folk have been talking about and I think we can try and progress around that for the benefit of our young people, that would be good. Um, in terms of the last year, and we've talked about the the uh, effect of, of sc uh, homeschooling and so on. Uh, you know, I re represent some of the most deprived boards, not just in Northern Ireland but the United Kingdom, and therefore, you know, homeschooling as a challenge has been a challenge for many of those families uh, in terms of capacity, in terms of technology, in particular. Uh, so. You know, I think that's something which we have to bear in mind. And I suppose the COVID pandemic has brought an extra, an added focus to all of this in your work. Could I ask then, given COVID and the negative effects of COVID, how has that shaped your work in terms of um, the, the work that had started in February and the experience gained over the last year or so? I, I think for, for me, it's really emphasised the strength of our curriculum. Um, one of the questions we've been asked is, you know, why do our children do so well? Um, you know, in those uh, 
Pearls and Tim's uh, tests. And I, I think it does come down to, you know, we have a very child-centred approach to uh, delivery of the curriculum with highly qualified staff. Um, and we have a good, as I say, a good curriculum that's well delivered. And that, uh, that curriculum has allowed the flexibility so that the schools have been able to adapt their teaching and learning to the circumstances that we've found themselves in and that they will be able to build on that moving forward. So I think that has come across, and, the, and I think that's one of the important things that we've got to, we've realised in this, it's about communicating that to parents so that they understand the value of it, you know, and what it involves, and that it does help children to progress, and as Robbie said, not just educationally, but also, you know, socially and emotionally as well. Yeah, and William, I think, just to make that point, um, you know, there's a, there is some research that have been looking at sort of rather more war-torn uh, places like um, Serbia and the Lebanon, who had schools interrupted, you know, physically no schools for a couple of years, and then brought children back. Uh, and and with good teaching practice and well-qualified teachers, children quickly recover. Uh, yes, there might be a deficit uh, that will last for a period of time, but they quickly recover by the time you're age 13 and 14, if you've missed a year or two of primary school, that has been, the evidence is showing that our systems, again, fix that, because our teachers teach the children, they don't just stand and teach what they uh, plan to teach that day, they look at the individuals that are in front of them and where they are, and they teach around that, teach around them. So, you know, we recognise that that's going to have happened, and that will happen, and that's what we also recognise, that that actually applies to children who are highly premature or are looked after or have any other vulnerable needs. Our teachers already teach to those children and to the needs that they have. I would also say um, I was actually pleasantly surprised. Our curriculum is skills-based and then it's thematic. So because we're not a content curriculum like other countries would experience, we were not held back. Teachers were very quickly easy to think about, you know what, we can teach this skill, but we can just use home home utensils. We can use a garden. You know, we're not held back by we need the resources in a classroom. They were able to still instruct those children at home to develop those skills by using stuff at home, which actually the kids are then still engaged. They're still excited. They're still learning without even particularly realizing, you know, they're missing a content that they would maybe get in a classroom. And just on a, um, a, a sort of system-wide basis, I mean, I think the system reacted very well. Even going back to when schools first closed last March, uh, we very quickly put in place uh, projects to support schools, provide resources to schools and parents and children. Those went online very quickly. Uh, these were followed up by teacher training webinars. And I think the, benef the benefits of that were shown whenever the second lockdown happened after. After Christmas, I think lots more schools reacted better second time round because of the support that had been put in the first time round. I suppose. I suppose the, the the question is obviously you know just you know there's a there's a different type of learning coming from COVID um, and the negativity around COVID and and I suppose that helps shape a more rounded proposal that will come out of of your work that will come in front of the assembly and 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 I suppose. Uh, whilst we want to see see this being placed before the floor of the house as quickly as possible, that will that will help in the longer term. Should we face, hopefully not, but should we face these things again? Look, I agree that schools we have good schools and we have good motivated and professional teachers. That's n not a question. It, my concern is the, the the differential will come when you know when children are being homeschooled if the technology isn't there if the capacity isn't there and so on that's where i'm concerned and i think that that's been something which has come to light during during the pandemic could i ask you then in terms of um uh the the actual system that that may well come out at the far end of it in terms of the work you've done and a few people have mentioned the finnish system and so on uh, which system or countries uh uh, system do you believe you know is best suited to replace ours should we need to replace it or update ours or improve ours i think what we're doing at the moment is to kind of look at what does operate in different places and if that was applied how that would apply here and what the scale would they then involve so in terms of that delivery mechanism we'd be looking at should this be something that you can automatically uh, you know get if you fall within a particular group or uh, um can you automatically do that without going 
to some kind of panel or do you have to have a kind of a, a panel approach where experts and again know what that might would have to consider who, what that might constitute would consider the individual cases of children and you know would that be uh, the EA school education welfare you know health visitors you know who would be involved in that or you can have a model where you have to have a mixture of the two so some can automatically apply if you fall within a certain category but to avoid that kind of cliff edge that Adrian talked about you then can have a wider group can be considered by a panel and I think that's actually what happens in Scotland isn't it the, yeah, the model that's yeah. adopted there so at the moment that's what we're scoping out and as, as I say for each of those we have to consider what would the scale of it be and then what would be the financial and legislative implications of that decision. I when when you mention Scotland could I just ask you to put a wee bit of meat on the bones there what I mean what, what happens in Scotland? In, in Scotland, there, there's an automatic right. Uh, their cut-off date, I think, is uh, uh, March. So that it's children who are born... Beginning of March for one year to the end yeah. of February following year, yeah. So they have, for the children born in the two months prior to that, you have an automatic right to just simply ask the education authority within your local council to defer, and that's automatically granted. And if you do uh, get it granted, you automatically get a position, you get automatically get a funded preschool place for your child. For, for parents who are, uh, or children who are born in the six months before that, uh, there is a, a right to request it, but it's not it's it's at the discretion of the school and at the discretion of the local authority, and they go to. There's no there's nothing in their legislation which says who will make that decision within the local authority. It's just a local authority decision, and it's also discretionary then if any children do get that as to whether there's a second funded year of preschool education. So we're looking at that. We're looking at whether the similar systems that operate in England, but again in England they have a differential system where you know one local authority because of funding concerns might do it in one way and another local authority might just turn down virtually everything etc uh, the, the, the system their legislation does allow a little bit of flexibility where ours is much uh, much more set in stone where we can't do that within our current system which is why we have to look at the legislation that's the impact of this okay hey, William. Uh, thank you very much thank you thanks william nicola brogan mla please for bringing your evidence here today. The, I welcome this discussion. Um, it's a really important discussion, as I've already said, and it is a positive one. Um, and I'm really pleased that the Minister has agreed to bring this legislation forward. Um, in saying that, as it has been discussed this morning, the time scale and the delay to bringing forward the legislation is really disappointing. I know families and parents have been in touch with me and organisations like Tiny Life will be really disappointed by the delay in it. Um, and rightly so. I think we need to remember uh, behind all this are the children who whose whole lives can be affected by whether or not by their school starting age and the support they receive. Um, so I can really empathise with um, with parents and um, I, I can understand their frustration. Um, so I'd like to move on to the impact of the school starting age legislation on preschools and childcare and what the department um, is doing to address any potential impact or effect that this new legislation will have on preschools and um, the childcare sector. I think that is, Nicola, one of the things that we are considering because what if you if a child does dif decide to defer, what would happen? At the moment, the legislation, once you've reached compulsory education, you're not entitled to a place in a preschool, except if you have a statement of special educational needs, and that statement says that it is in the child's best interest to remain in a preschool setting so they can get two years of preschool education. But for the most part, that piece of legislation doesn't enable that. So that is just another example of a place where we'd need to look at that that legislation to see, to, to enable that to happen. The, the other point about that is then the, the scale of it, depending on how many children it involves, that what the financial implications would be of any decision to allow, allow that. I think another important point it raises 
is the timing of a decision. You know, do you make a decision on deferring before preschool or at the point of primary school as well? So that's, I mean, you know, it's a really important point that you raise, and, and, but it is on our radar and we are considering all of that in, in, the, in the options. And what about logistically for child care facilities and that, for facilitating more numbers um, or greater numbers of kids? Have you thought about that or what provisions have you put in place for that? Yeah, that has been brought to our attention as well. And, and the impact on other projects that are there. So, for example, Sure Start. You know, if you're a child is deferring and you should start, what impact does it have on that? So, no, that's why it's been, it's been really helpful to us for that engagement, you know, with delivery partners as well as the policy teams in here to look at what's on and what they're developing as well so that we do have a full picture. But we keep being reminded that, you know, poor policy makes poor legislation. So what we're trying to do at this stage is, is make sure that we're aware of all of those issues and giving them really careful consideration. And as I say, that stakeholder engagement has been particularly important yeah. to that, you know, with, with the individuals who are impacted by it, not only in the delivery, but on receiving those kind of services. Uh, Nicola, I think that it make, you're making a, a point that I'm surprised nobody has raised, I suppose, to this point. Um, we're looking at the systems, but if, if, let's just say you make a criteria that allows 10, 15 percent of children to defer at some point, you're going to have to change the admissions criteria to preschool. You'd have to change the admissions criteria to primary school uh, and to post-primary school to reflect that those children who have deferred would automatically be higher in the ranking, or do you not? There, you need, we need to think through all of the implications on admissions criteria, because fundamentally, if you're saying these children are uh, requiring the, uh, a change to their education system, do they become the highest priority children going into a nursery school or into a primary school and into a post-primary school? And how will that impact on the enrolment and the catchment areas of those primary schools? And again, we're trying to make sure that we don't get unintended consequences where you again go, I want to get my child into school A, and the only way to do that is if they're the oldest. Do you know, you know what I mean? The, the, yeah, we I know what you mean. System here, uh, and we, when we do one thing and we create another impact down the other end. I do know what you mean, and I, obviously that's why I'm raising it. I think it's, it's um, really important to take all this into consideration when going forward with legislation. Um, but I think it's a wee bit unfair to suggest that they would be prioritised for any kind of reason. Um, but definitely it's something that needs to be worked on. And, and uh, as you say, Karen, engage with, um, with key stakeholders um, with any kind of decision making there. Um, I just also want to touch upon um, something you just mentioned there, Karen, too, about special educational needs. In the last briefing there um, from the Assembly researcher, we heard that the evidence suggested that there's a disproportionate number of young children in the school year are referred for special educational needs. Um, and according to that research, um, many seem to be misdiagnosed. Have you any thoughts on that there? or? Yeah, I, I heard that, Nicola, in the last one, and, it, and what immediately struck me was that there's a really important thing about understanding what the need is. You know, there are different kinds of educational need, and, I, and it, it did strike me that, and I think that we would have information here within the department even to look at that, you know, if they're in a setting and have need, what is the nature of the need, um, yeah. you know, and I think that's important because it could be a range of uh, medical or physical yeah. or... Um, social behavior, uh, behavioural, so there's such a range, and I think that, yeah, we'd need to take a closer look at that detail. Yeah, and again, it, it is a piece of research we're aware of. It, it was it was prepared by, uh, uh, the, by a researcher from the educational uh, side within the Education Authority, and it's from about 2010, 2011, so, you know, 10 years later, we need to check that that conclusion, that finding is still relevant. Things have changed considerably within our educational environment. That's part of our remit in terms of going back to the basic numbers here to go, uh, who is affected, what is the evidence showing us, what are the numbers showing us, and we will go back and update that evidence where we can get it. I think we do. Yeah, well, that's why I raise it, because I think it is an important topic and, again, um, important part to um, inspect going forward with the legislation. Um, listen, that's all I have to ask you. I do think it's um, a really positive discussion and change that we need to see. So um, hopefully we can 
move forward quickly um, and get get it by the, uh, by the next mandate, by the end of this mandate. So thank you and thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks for that, Nicola. Uh, as Morris had left a message that there had been a, a bit of an emergency um, that he had to attend to. Is Morris there? Morris Bradley, want to come in? Thank you. Yep. Morris. Sorry. Right, Chair, where are you? <laughs> no, no problem. We, we can we can hear you. Uh, do you want to uh, come in yeah. to ask a question of the department yep. in, in relation to flexible school starting age? Chair, I'm doing a wee thing for the PSNI here on, and could you move on, please? And, no, and no, no problem, Morris. No problem. Good wishes with whatever emergency you're dealing with there. Thank you. We've lost sound there. Sorry, I'm on mute. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, you, I'll have to give you guys that control at some point. Be handy for you. Mute him. Mute him. Mute him. <laughs> um, so, um, th thanks. Thanks very much for your engagement today. It, as you've you've heard, it is it is a an important issue to the committee and committee members, and we recognise that. Um, it, it's now a priority for, for your work program as well. Um, the time skills was, was obviously a key issue. If it, I'm not sure exactly how we would go about doing this, but um, it, you know, when, when it comes to engagement with the, the committee to see how helpful um, we can be in relation to trying to meet uh, a, a rapid delivery of that legislation, um, please feel free to engage with us formally or, or informally um, to see how we can all work together to progress this legislation as, quick, as quickly as possible. That's really helpful. Thank you. And we will we'll keep in, in touch and let you know, you know how it's progressing and when it's gone to missed and when those decisions are made and maybe talk to you, um, if, you know, at that prior or just it's going to consultation, you know, so that yeah. we can yeah. uh, engage with you. you know, keep is there, is, yeah, is there 12 week versus eight week? What's, what's the thinking on that? I, th I think, Chris, it's about the, the start. You know, if we can get this started on consultation by mid June, I think we'll have to go for twelve weeks because it, we have to recognise it's over the summer period. Summer, okay. Yeah, and that, we'll do that. But hopefully, that gives us enough time, you know, to engage with yourself, even. Yeah, then. I mean, ideally, we would like to get it out in mid June and then have a session with yourself to sort of do that formal consultation and look at the actual options that are presented, mm -hmm. and engage with that point. And and we've already been engaging quite considerably with, with those organisations and we'll be meeting a few more and we will continue to do that um, mm -hmm. as quickly as we can. But it's just that, that the, the Equality Commission's minimum is, is eight weeks uh, mm -hmm. and that's, that's where that comes from and the 12 sure. weeks is really just good practice. Anything we can do to shorten it and we're very happy, happy to engage with the committee around that. And, and if there's any, as I say, formal or informal way to engage throughout the process to preempt certain issues or considerations um happy to happy to try and be constructive in that regard rather than to wait for just the the, the normal uh formal procedural ways of doing things if, if that's uh constructive all right okay, that's really helpful thank you so much thank you thank you no problem thanks very much and we we'll wish you well with that important work thank you thanks thank you, thank you. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and add members back into the spotlight and ask the clerk to summarise any actions resulting from the briefing. Thanks, clerk. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think, um, the, clerk, just before you start, can I advise members maybe to mute themselves unless and until they need to speak and they avoid background noise? Thanks. Okay. So uh, the committee might want to hear from stakeholders about views on this, um, and I think uh, it would be it would be good to um, write to the department um, on a few of the issues that were raised. Um, so primarily that the committee would be very disappointed if this legislation were not to be passed in this mandate, um, notwithstanding all of the other parameters. Um, and that the uh, department should keep the committee up to date on the development of the policy, its scale and financial implications, the draft consultation options. Um, it did seem imminent that officials would be 
preparing consultation options and um, the committee might want an, an update as early as June um, on those. Um, and then some other issues that came up were um, about the skills-based approach um, of the DEA curriculum. Um, so, you know, where there is a, a disjuncture between that and the holistic development of children, um, say, in terms of motor skills or um, play, you know, will the legislation then calibrate um, with other European um, approaches? Um, there was a specific question about whether the decision to retain a child for an extra year would be reviewed in the legislation. Um, and, I mean, just fundamentally, I think it's interesting, you know, is deprivation the only reason why everyone currently starts school so young in Northern Ireland relative to neighbouring jurisdictions? Um, and whether the, the policy will scope the option of formal schooling beginning at age six or seven, um, as happens in so many other jurisdictions, as well as this deferral option. Um, so that's just about the scope of the legislation. Um, and then there was a specific question towards the end about um, misdiagnosis of special educational needs. The department um, said it would have a look at its statistics and that it um, might be able to update the 2010 finding that was referred to there. So I think we could put that in, in writing as well. Do members have anything additional? Chair, uh, yes, Chair. Robin, yep. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I agree with the summary from the committee clerk there. Just Maybe just uh, in terms of engaging with stakeholders, uh, perhaps some of the charitable organisations such as Bernardo's uh, might be included in that. And then obviously if there are, Chair, some individual parents who might wish to make a, uh, to, to give evidence to, to the committee if that could be covered. Uh, and uh, Chair, I, I am a bit, I am not quite understanding this action. You must seek advice. The school will offer you support. But if you wish to delay, you need to provide an enriched educational experience. And the point that William made, certainly in the pandemic situation, those who come from perhaps a less well-off background would find that difficult to meet this requirement if there's any measurement on it, of an enriched educational experience. Yeah, maybe we, should, we could seek clarity on, on those matters, Clark. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other members wish to come in or content to agree those actions for now? I think you could probably add tiny life to the stakeholders yeah. there as well um, and I know some in, individual parents too, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no. members, agreed? Content to agree those actions, members, yeah. Agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Clark, can we move to agenda item eight, correspondence then? Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, I can refer members to page 41, where we have 17 items of correspondence and a summary note at page 43. Okay, Clark. Yeah, um, it's just opening up for me, sorry. Okay. Um, um, item 83 on page uh, 51 is a response from the Minister of Education regarding alternative exam arrangements. The department indicates that each school and college must submit to CCEA um, by 23rd of April, so they'll have done it by now, a policy outlining the details of the awarding arrangements um, pertinent to their setting. Um, including details of the evidence to be used to support the holistic judgment to determine grades. Um, CCEA will then quality assure these policies to ensure consistency with the process that was set out um, in the five-step um, documentation. Um, so members, uh, this, is, this is kind of the only way to see into um, the balance of uh, controlled assessment and other kinds of assessment. Um, that are being carried out in schools. Um, the department and CECA wrote that um, the, it was up to individual schools to make this decision, so they weren't 
monitoring um, how much controlled assessment was happening. So, I mean, it may be that you want to arrange an oral briefing with CCEA about um, the, the policies that have been submitted by schools. Yeah, that, that, that's not a bad suggestion. Um, Clark, uh, the, the, this correspondence is in response from our committee request um, regards how and the extent of assessment occurring is being monitored by the department. And I think the sum total of that response is that it's not and that they don't know how much assessment is taking place. Um, they, they also, and say they, obviously it's the minister, um, the correspondence says no particular weighting is attached to different types of evidence. Um, they, I think there's been real uh, mixed communication in relation to this matter. Um, I'm, I'm looking at one piece of guidance that says, while the use of the assessment resources provided by SEA is optional, we would encourage centres to use the assessment resources under high control conditions where the public health situation allows to ensure they have the greatest value. And then you have this correspondence saying no particular weighting is attached to different types of evidence. Uh, to me, that's just a huge contradiction, but no matter how many times the committee and others say that, we're continuing to get this response um, back from the department and the minister. Daniel, you had raised the, these issues on a number of occasions. I, I'm not quite sure what more we can do at this stage, other than, as the clerk says, to ask Sia um, what, what response they've received from schools with regards to the approaches that are being taken. Um, given the department and Sia seem wholly disinterested in any type of, of monitoring or assessment of the approaches that are being taken by schools. Yeah, Chair, it's, 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 it's around the concerns. The concerns we have is around the time that it takes for CA to make a determination. What happens to schools in that period and the effect that it, that it has? It, you know, we've been keeping a very close eye on uh, on this stuff uh, for some time, and you know, it's very hard to determine the lessons we've been learned from last year in a lot of instances, to be very blunt about it, to be honest. So. Okay. Uh, Clark, when are we scheduled to receive briefing from CA with regards to the appeals process? for this year? No date as of yet? No, we haven't scheduled that yet, but we can okay. move on forward work okay. on that year, if you like. Uh, okay, yeah, I, th I think if we, maybe we present an updated request for when we're receiving that, and for that to include um, what, if any, degree of oversight they have played with the approaches that are being taken by schools in relation to assessment, given some of the, ex the concerns we've received about the extent of that assessment from young people in particular. That okay? When you're while you're noting that, Clark, if I could go back to item eight point two very briefly, um, it was in response to our um, correspondence uh, seeking an update on the provision of sport, drama, art, culture, and music um, during school restart. Uh, the minister advises that inter-school sports are not permitted at this time, and we'd obviously been contacted by principles in relation to that matter. Is it possible to re, um, reply to that, to ask the minister why inter-school sports are not permitted at this time and if and when they, uh, and under what conditions they might be? Members content with that question? Agreed, yes. yep, yeah. okay. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Clark. 8.4, I think. Or Sure. Yes, thank you. So 8.4 on page 55 then is a response um, from the Minister providing further information on COVID-19 testing and the vaccination programme in special schools. Um, so members, it just um, what, would you, what would your response to that one be? So, sorry, Evening. I'm sorry, Chair, for doing this. Can I just go back to 8.3 just for one second, please? Just yeah. something that's been raised with me on a couple of occasions now with regard to um, the guidance that's been given by CCEA to teachers and schools with regard to pupils who are taking TCSEs or A-levels who have additional needs. Um, there's, one, there's one section in that section that I think in the, the guidance, and there's, there's genuinely not a lot to it. So if a couple of constituents who's, um, whose uh, children have, by nature, uh, classroom assistance through their education, and obviously, I haven't been in school and I haven't been in this. I think that the guidance is very willing. Um, the schools obviously have the 
choice to make now with regard to do children's assessments, but we would propose nothing like this, or, or can the school then provide other evidence? I think whatever action we take with regard to CCA, whether we're going to seek um, to speak to them again, that's something we need to, to find a little bit more information about. Uh, the genuine is very, very little literature uh, when you look at the, the guidance. Okay, we can include that in our correspondence with CA, Clark. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, so, 8.4 is in relation to uh, our letter seeking further information on the vaccination program for eligible sco special school staff. Um, so, uh, could, I, could I propose that we write back to ask, you know, how many and what percentage of special school staff have been vaccinated as a result of the expansion of eligibility? Um, we'd also asked about uh, testing and the extent of the update we received was my officials continue to engage with the chief medical officer in relation to testing. Um, can you maybe go back and ask for a bit more detail than that in terms of um, uh, outcomes of testing, okay. uh, positive cases, uh, procedures that are in place for that? Sure. Members content with that? Agreed? Yeah, agreed, Chair, but are you intending to go straight to the Minister of Health as opposed to the, the medical officer? Uh, the correspondent says uh, officials are engaging with the chief medical officer, so I, I presume the department can 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 do so to answer that question as well then. Yep. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks. Clark? Okay. Um, so item 5, on, sorry, 8.5 on page 59, and in table papers is a response from the department regarding the impact of COVID-19 on the lives of children and young people. Um, so table today is the uh, is a big PDF that was attached um, in your original pack and was an opening. Um, members, are you content to forward that to the young people um, who came up to the committee's panel um, on ten on the tenth of March? Yep, agreed. Um, I think members will want to take time to digest that implementation plan for the emotional health and wellbeing framework um, given when it was received and, and maybe come back to that in future meetings then Clark but members can tend to agree to send that to the youth organisations with, with, with which we'd engaged, agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank, you. Thank you. I mean it will be interesting for some of our forward work planning and discussion later on engagement with um, young people as well. Um, okay, thank you. So Clark, just just on that briefly on the 8.5, because there, there's a number of issues in there as well. It also references a primary school counselling pilot. Um, is it possible for us to um, ask for further detail of the primary school counselling pilot in terms of how many schools that will include? Sure. Members can tend to agree that. And um, then I think we'd also listen to the Minister with regards to... Uh, the uh, wearing of trousers uh, by female pupils. Um, the minister's response states that while its guidance does not specifically mention the wearing of trousers by female pupils, it does encourage schools to consider the seasonable, the seasonable suitability of wearing shorts or skirts in the winter and wearing heavy tights or warm blazers in the summer. Um, I'm not really sure on how that helps anybody in relation to permission to wear trousers. Um, maybe members can reflect on whether we want to ask another question in relation to that at, at a future date, but it, it seems to be a, a significant dodge of the question um, as far as I can see. So if it, members want to have a think about that, because I know we have been contacted by um, pupils about seeking permission to wear uh, trousers. Um, it's, uh, it seems like it's a, a, a bottle pass to schools themselves in relation to that, whenever we were looking for a bit more leadership on that issue, I think. That's just one there is with uh, members and if they want to come back on that at a future date then. Okay, Clark. 
Yeah. Um, item 8.7 on page 88 is correspondence from the department um, informing the committee that the department has made the addressing bullion in schools 2016 Act commencement order Northern Ireland 2021. Um, and the committee is due to be briefed by officials on this at its meeting next week. Um, so that being the case, are members content to note that correspondence for now? Great. Great members, yep. Um, item 8.8 8, um, on page 92 is a response from the Department of Health on the um, Autism Strategy actions, Action Plans. Um, these were sought uh, as a result of the briefing that we had with Autism NI. Um, and I mean, do members want to send those to Autism NI or to schedule further business on this item? If we set forward them on the Autism NI and seek their response in the first instance. Sure. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed, members. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, item 813 on page 145 is correspondence from the Equality Commission on its report on family and community engagement in education and um, learning from the pandemic. Um, members, would you like to invite the Equality Commission to provide a briefing on this report? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. Members could just give me uh, an agreed every now and again for clarity purposes. Thank you. So members can tend to agree to take a briefing on, on that report. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Thanks. Item 8.14 on page 176 is correspondence from Parent Action. Um, now, they're, uh, they were asking for the nomination of a member to speak or record a little um, uh, video at Parent Action Connect's online conference about the role of a parent care guardian. Um, in Northern Ireland. The conference is actually uh, tomorrow, so this is this is an item that was in um, PAX last week um, and didn't get to be discussed last week. Um, but the committee doesn't have a position on the role of a parent care guardian, so um, members, do you, do you mind if I suggest parent action that they contact you individually about this? Yeah, I think that's best at this stage, Clark. And maybe even if uh, you want to offer uh, for the for the committee to use one of its in informal meeting sessions to meet with Parent Action to receive a bit more detail about um, how they foresee the role of a, a parent's care guardian being developed, would members be content with that being proposed? Agreed. Okay, Clark. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, 815 on page 187 is correspondence from concerned individuals about speech, language and occupational therapy services for children with autism and, um, and the, what the role of Belfast Health and Social Care Trust is in delivering these. Um, the parents have concerns about a move away from individual and small group therapy towards assessment and advice only um, with teachers um, bearing more of the responsibility. Um, so, uh, members, are you content to write to the Education Authority about this policy issue um, and see whether there are plans to change the delivery of services um, in schools by trusts? Yeah, Clark, this is obviously a, a, a serious issue and um, a, a wide, wider set of issues that the committee has focused on. Can we, would members be content for us to forward this correspondence to the Education Authority CEO, but also the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust CEO um, to get a, a response to the, the wider issues that are raised therein. I think we should forward it to the Department of Education in order that they're aware of it as well, Clark. Mem mem members content? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thanks. Agreed. Um, and that, that's all then. So we're members content to dispose of the correspondence um, as per the summary note at page 43 with subject to those that I mentioned to you. Agreed. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Clark. Then agenda item that, that concludes correspondence. Agenda item nine is the forward work program. Can I refer members to draft forward work program at page 207? The committee has planned a youth engagement event. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just 
for a rogue program has, has there been any there has been no Kirk, has there been any correspondence in the GTC about their coming attendance? There there hasn't it. I think it's probably best that we uh, sorry Clark, go ahead. It's been tabled today, um, and we were planning to move to it just after this item. Right, okay, right. In private or public, Chair? I think we, I think we should consider it in, in closed session, given some of the items that are raised there in Daniel. Right, okay. Okay. Uh, we'll deal with forward work program here as well, anyway, first. So... Pay, the committee has planned uh, a youth engagement event. Um, um, we've uh, had some challenge getting a date. Would Thursday, the 3rd of June, uh, be possible and entabled items today? There's a draft invitation uh, to the event um, with a, a suggested focus on emotional health and well being um, of children and young people and details of school focus groups by the education service, um, which would feed into the perspective of younger post-primary pupils. Uh, a call out for uh, poems, stories, artworks from age groups to feed into our engagement. Would members be content with this plan and open to having a, a meeting or event to celebrate the responses that we would receive in mid to end June? Members content with that? Sorry, Chair, I'm on the Communities Committee. It meets on Thursdays. Evening. If we if we go for late afternoon, early evening, I think, was it, is that the intensity of Clark? Yeah, it's 6.30 to 8.30. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll we'll check. Check. Chair, that won't, that won't suit, me, suit me because of a long-standing engagement, but, but go ahead. Thanks. Okay, okay. Well, if members could respond uh, directly with the clerk to confirm attendance at that, uh, it's essential for planning purposes that, that the clerk gets a response from each of us in relation to that date. Um, maybe propose the clerk to contact us directly if necessary and we respond accordingly. Okay. Um, also, there's just, just, sorry, one wee detail. There's... Um, the education and engagement services are going to be working with us on this. Um, the education service will do focus groups um, with some younger children um, and they have come up with the title. So if you have a look at your documents, there's a list of titles um, and they have preferred one. So if you can let me know as well, if you're happy with the title of it. Okay. The event. Okay. We can do that, no problem. Thank you. Okay, uh, Clark, is any other forward work program items need to raise at this stage? No. No, um, the, if, just if members want to open it and have a wee look at page 207, um, you can see you know, how many, how many um, item, meetings we have left before summer. Um, and so I provisionally put in um, on the 16th of June, Children's Commissioner on SEND Framework um, and another SEND stakeholder on the SEND Framework, then with the um, oral briefing the following week on that, because like, that's quite a large piece of work. Um, and then our last meeting before the summer recess would be on the 30th of June in the Senate, which is our longer meeting. So. Um, I'm just kind of suggesting you might have a youth engagement um, item there or the CCEA on contingencies um, and the, those matters that were discussed just now. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the restrictions, the public safety restrictions will allow us to do a visit before the summer, um, but there's a forest school visit in um, our forward work program that could be scheduled if members wished. Um, so yeah, just to, to let you know what we've got there um, coming up. So, so today was school starting age, next week, relationship and sexuality education and addressing bullying in schools. The following week, restraint and seclusion. Um, and then we're gonna go into close now to talk about the what might happen on the 26th of May. Okay, members content to endorse the forward work program as amended? Agreed. 
Good time, Joe. Okay, thanks. Um, Clark, will we take any other uh, business um, so that we can uh, go into a uh, closed session without having to return? And agenda item 10, members, is any other business? No. Okay, well, if I could ask uh, members to stay uh, for a very brief uh, closed consideration of one other outstanding item in relation to forward work program then, um, but advise assembly broadcasting then that we were uh, moving into closed session. Uh, and that brings the public session of the... Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.